This is Grab the Mic. My name is Bryce Prescott, and I'm showing you a behind-the-scenes look to a world many are drawn to but few understand. Stand-up comedy. My goal is to make you laugh, make you think, and bring you along on my journey to greatness as a comedian. Now, if you'll excuse me, it's time I grab the mic. Now, keep it going for Bryce Prescott. So we're rolling, guys. You know how I do it. Organic from the flow. Free range. Free range. What's up? <laughs> so just so that everybody knows, I got uh, a, a round tour here. Guys, this is weird with this thing all jacked. John Deming, welcome back to the show. That's right, baby. I'm in the two-timers club. Yeah, it's the only thing you've done twice in your life that's relatively morally uh, questionable. So I'm proud of you <laughs> for being here. <laughs> Mike Tibbs. Uh, yeah, long-time listener, first-time caller. <laughs> Why did I know you were going to pull some sort of like sports radio thing out there? I like it. Starts asking us some Dr. Ruth questions that I am <laughs> not qualified to answer. You see, what happens when you have too much buildup? It creates tension that <laughs> can cause preeclampsia. And... <laughs> this is oddly a topic we talk about almost every time me and Bryce talk. What's that? Is how badly Bryce wants me to get laid. Like, I. <laughs> It's, it's true, dude. And it's not because I'm like wanting you to fall off some moral like high horse. It's more that like I know what getting laid is like, and it's pretty cool. So <laughs> I no, like my friends true. to like enjoy you, good uh, stuff, you know. You're you're basically putting in your missionary work for sexual. In activity. a way, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, it's questionable what side I'm doing the missionary work for, though. But I don't necessarily want to take upon myself that hedonistic. I don't know. Okay. okay. Cool. Anyway, <laughs> speaking of like the missionary thing, you're gonna want to get was, a little closer there, buddy. Yeah. I, speaking of like the missionary thing, I was talking to, to Mike on the way up. It was the first time we did a gig this weekend with the like ex Mormon conference thing. Yeah, yeah, I was actually wanting to talk about that. I'm glad um, you brought it up. Somebody called me brave, <laughs> which is such an icky thing to say to a comedian. <laughs> I do not want to be called brave. Just oh, laugh. Dude, it, make, it makes Just it even laugh. better that you're called brave in that scenario as a comic. It was so <laughs> vanilla, dude. Yeah, exactly. No, well, here's the thing, though, is that, like, so he called me brave because I did, like, a joke of, like, kind of ripping on racist people in Utah. Yeah. Which, like, in that room, that's not a brave joke at all. That's, like, what they want. That's almost pandering in that room. Which was juxtaposed against uh, JD's racist jokes, so... <laughs> right. <laughs> which you could tell they were pulling back from. Oh, which I, is so I love when JD does that, though. He's just like, yeah. I'm, I'm not going away, guys. Like, yeah. And it's not even a really racist joke. It's just... I don't know. Yeah. It's interesting what people pull back on. I have found... Because... I don't know. I don't consider myself a particularly edgy, edgy person until I perform in Utah... And people are pulling back at, like, everything that I say. Like, even self-deprecating stuff. People will be like, oh, and they'll be, like, afraid to laugh. It's like, guys, I wouldn't be saying this if I wanted that reaction. I want you to laugh. There's going to come a That's... point in your near future, John, where you're going to actually, like, be outside of, like... <laughs> out what of the they, bubble? What do they call it? They call it the... Uh... Not the promised land, the the mission field. You're gonna be out. You're gonna be out in the mission field, <laughs> as they refer to uh, anything outside of Provo. Yeah, that's a whole other can of worms to unpack. And uh, yeah. it's a can of powdered milk, actually. Um, <laughs> sure. It's uh, a and you're gonna realize that like a lot of the stuff that you have become sensitive about, like nobody gives a shit about. No, that's what I mean. Is that yeah. there's stuff that I don't have a problem saying, but people are just so on edge to hear to like stuff yeah. that's not even. I one time went to a show in Provo where, like, it was a sketch show. These are my favorite stories, by the way. <laughs> I know. It was a sketch show, and they, it was like all of the people were wearing signs that represented, like, different things that could distract you while you're trying to do homework because it was, like, the most college -y thing ever. And it was like, one was, like, hunger, one is sleep, one of them's Netflix, and then one was, like, Redbox. And they were like, get out of here, Redbox. Nobody likes you. And everyone was like, aww. Like, for Redbox? <laughs> You're sympathizing for Redbox? There's people getting like, like human trafficking going on in this world, and you I have time so to empathize for Redbox. Dude, I find it so funny that like that's an idea of a thing you went to though. It's like, what bad roadshow ideas can we bring into a comedy sketch show? <laughs> it was, the thing is, the the premise for the sketch was was actually fairly strong, and like the writing was 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 pretty good. 
it's just that like the sketch people of BYU like they they definitely draw in like a family audience so sure. they get like five six year old kids at their show sometimes like it's oh, wow. like people's family's night out is they're gonna go see a comedy show and so like they I mean I've talked about like when I was at BYU stuff that we would get in trouble for saying but they it's they have it way worse like they had to like cut their headlining sketch that they were advertising the show on because it was like a, a riff on like Moana and somebody thought that was racist. And so they had to like basically like restructure their show around that. And so, and they get like, I've heard them get complaints like you shouldn't ever make fun of politicians and just like they get complaints almost every show. And like, that's the thing is we usually didn't get complaints because our audience wasn't big enough that people who didn't get the joke would come. Yeah. But they like, since they're such an established brand. Dude, like, talk, talking to you reminds me kind of like when I, I, I obviously I had Wes Austin on the show and and uh, I've been yeah. able to develop a I, I really enjoy him as a friend. He's just a great dude, and I feel a lot of uh, a lot in common with him in a lot of ways. And it's a similar thread. Like he was talking about when, uh, you know, if, if, if you guys watch, did you watch the IP section? Have you seen it? Yeah. Okay. So you know that part where like there's the dude in the church that's like no evil speaking of the Lord's anointed. We can't like <laughs> yeah, laugh. Yeah, yeah. Like, and, like he was, he was poking fun at that. But that was like something that like has been as you know I used to be LDS. You currently are like you know you, both of you guys are. That's right. something that is actually still kind of there. Though. Like you got to be careful about what you poke fun at. There's so much. There's such a thing as too much laughter, and it's like. Wow. Okay. Yeah, and it's it's an interesting thing for sure. Um, I don't understand the, the the that same joke that he was like talking to that that guy was talking to me about how brave it was. Like, if I told it at BYU, which joke was he referring to? It's the one where I make fun of people in Utah that think black people were like neutral. Oh yeah, yeah. In the like Malcolm the fight joke. against yeah, Satan. Yeah. So like, obviously, like it's a ridiculous thing, and so I make fun of it. If I had made fun of that, like at BYU, then maybe I could see somebody saying, "Oh, like that was like." a really edgy idea for you to bring here because it's not what they're used to. But, like, at an ex-Mormon conference to, like, poke fun at, like, silly things about Mormons is, like, not an edgy thing. That's, like... That's almost like making jokes about the city you're in. It's kind of like Comedy 101. You throw the audience a bone for something they want to hear so they'll go along yeah. with your other stuff, you know? I think it's still brave, though. <laughs> it's very brave. I don't know. It's. I think Am I crazy? Isn't it, isn't it weird to be <laughs> called brave? Well, yeah, especially when you're not, like, giving any ribbing commentary that's socially relevant. Like, you making a, a little rib about, you know, that not only – there's there's a large portion of the population that thinks that's, like, reading from Tolkien. It's, like, not even real. So, like, right. to, to make a joke about a, a supposed, you know, theology, right. like, that's even in a whole different other realm where it's, like – Certain people don't care. They're like, oh, he's right. talking about the fa the fantasy story. That's there's no yeah. bravery in that at all. So like, but when you consider the room, like, that was an interesting thing. Like, I, I was able to I, I became friends with a couple of people from that conference on Facebook, and I did a little. Uh, little Everybody like, seems super Facebook nice. Facebook stock, you know, dude. That <laughs> that Thrive conference was. Uh, I actually I don't know if I fully am behind. Like, well, I haven't experienced a lot of the things that they claim to have experienced, so I can't like make a judgment sure. there. But I do like the essence to what they created that with, which is basically like a community of healing. If you've been hurt and there's things to where you felt rep not repressed, but oppressed, um, mm -hmm. you, you have people that you, you can talk to about it. Sure. And that's a real kind of tentative thing. Like that can go south real quickly where it's just a bunch of bashing. But at the same time, like if it's done right, which it seems like they have like kind hearted people that are associated there. It that was my experience. Yeah. Yeah. They were great. Like, if that weren't the case, I don't think they would have been willing to laugh at me. Right. <laughs> well, their laughter would have been different, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they wouldn't have been willing to laugh with me. Is probably a better way. It was a great to... room, man. It was. Cool. It was. No, and it I was, was really surprised at the yeah. demographic of people there too. There was like really. There was older people. I was guys in their sixties, seventies, sure. you know. And then there was obviously young people, and yes. Yeah. Was... Well, there were a lot of things that made me think it was not going to go well for me. One of them is like the obvious that like, like. Who, well, other than JD, but shout out to JD, but like, you wouldn't think to book a very Mormon comic to headline your ex-Mormon convention. Actually, actually, here's, here's what I think though about that, John. I think that's a testament to how funny your stuff really is. 
It was definitely a confidence boost. Like, if you can do well in that room, like... Your stuff wasn't, like, pro or Mm anti-Mormon. It was just funny. Sure. And it was it was something that you didn't have to be an active Mormon to find funny. You you, you did such a good job, and, and you're just this way when, as you craft your jokes anyway. But like, is you're a part of like the experience of seeing you perform? It's just very clever, and you well, and thanks. you I appreciate you that. assume you, and brave. You forgot you, brave. Well, because you're not brave at all. Like, <laughs> <laughs> you're a white guy in a room of white people, so I don't know how much more <laughs> right. safe you could be, but. Yeah, I'm Obviously also I'm not brave in real life. <laughs> I, well, I'm you do very ride not brave. places with JD a lot, so that's a, <laughs> that's a form of bravery. Yeah, I um, but like there were a couple things that wasn't the only thing. There were there were like several factors that made me wonder. It's like, oh, is this gonna go well? Because first of all, it was like there was that thing of like it did have such a rich vibe to it, just being at a country club. Yeah, which threw me off a little bit, and also. Everything that happened before us was just so sincere. And like the guitarist chick playing yeah. Brandy Carlisle and Fornon Blondes with her cello accompaniment. Right. Her. Like Fornon Blondes was her quote unquote angry song. Yeah. And so like there's me and be like I'm <laughs> And she I she seemed about that. she seemed lovely, but she's like, you know, some of us have a lot of anger, so I'm gonna play an angry song. Gets up there, and to try, I'm on, I'm on a try. Like it's like that's your angry song. Well, dude, so I got a little bit caught up in the feels on that too, because that song she played by Brandy, Brandy Carlisle, the joke, yeah, is yeah. one of my favorite songs, dude. Like I have a gay daughter, I've joked about it. Like there yeah, is, a, she she was good. It's oh, just, she was great. Yeah, it's not it's not what you would imagine would get people ready to laugh. Well, when, I, what when I'm I was saying, sitting there, I was like, so how was, do I write a joke to like break the ice from this? Right, because everyone was like, people were crying before yeah. Bryce got up because Bryce was like hosting the comedy. And it wasn't part from it. fandom; it was from that they were crying from the guitar. Yeah, they were like so moved by John Lennon's Imagine that they oh, were. We, like, we doing this, John? We gonna do this? <laughs> <laughs> I wasn't going to. I was just bringing it up. We gotta anecdotally. get Mike involved somehow. He's over here. Like you might as well be the sound guy. There, he can be the mediator in our argument over whether Imagine is That's a, a good great song idea. or not. Because I know that John thinks more highly of good music than you do. So here's here's the truth. <laughs> he thinks Imagine is a shitty song. Yeah, I don't think it's a good. That song. he tells that he, that he says Imagine this, but he doesn't give you the picture of what it would look like if he did. It's just it's it shitty feels poetry. like a it feels like a first draft of a song. <laughs> Yeah, one like, of the most popular songs on the planet, first draft. Yeah. Well, just because it's popular doesn't mean it's good, necessarily, it's like or that I have to like it. Carly Rae Jepsen, right? One Hit Wonder. Are you really putting Mr. John No, Ryan I'm just saying, the there's a difference. Like, you can be popular and not be good. So that's the thing, is I feel like you think, because I don't like this song, I don't <laughs> like John Lennon. And you aside, said aside you from don't the, like John Lennon. No, I said I didn't like his stuff post Beatles. That's way different. Well, dude, that, he's Listen, not even Beatles alive songs at that are point. great. He, that's Tupac era. Like he's like a he's he's not even. Those, I agree with you there. But imagine was it, that was in that post. Yeah, that was like. Is this what Crow tastes? This is like? like early early seventies. <laughs> it was after the Beatles split up. Okay. It was like his second album after. And he's the like, Beatles hey Paul, why don't you go fuck yourself, Paul? That's that same album. Is <laughs> where he wrote the song. Hey, like, Paul. I don't like Paul how you McCartney. Ima- how about you imagine a Beatles without Joan? Yeah. There's also... Yeah, like... I feel like all the Beatles... George is the one that's the most consistent. And Paul and John have, like, really high highs and really low lows. I've got a song about an octopus. <laughs> <laughs> right. Like, like, Paul McCartney will write yesterday, and then he'll write, like, Wild Honey Pie. Which sounds like it's sung by Mr. Hanky, the Here's, Christmas this is, from this, South Park. This, was a, this, this threw context in it for me. So my father-in-law is a grumpy dude. He's, yeah. a, he's a great guy, but he's grumpy. And uh, he fucking hates the Beatles. Really? And I'm like, how can you... But my mom him, hates the Beatles, But too. hold on. But to him, the Beatles are like the Backstreet Boys. Like, it was a boy band that was super popular that all yeah. the chicks were into. And he's like, ugh, give me the doors all day long. Like, he was... It was yeah, we've all been mainstream. teenage boys who were afraid to like that kind of music, I guess. Yeah. My 17-year-old's like that. Like, he won't listen to anything mainstream. He's like into, like, you know... I've had to, like, rock. go back to stuff that came out while I was in high school and, like, reevaluate it. Because when I was in middle and high school, like... When did you go to high school? Or when were you, what year did you graduate? I graduated 2011. Oh my god, dude. Yeah, I know, right? But, uh, like, I've had to go back and reevaluate because 
when I was Do in middle school. Do you have pubes yet? Like, this is really an awkward <laughs> question, but I'm just curious. <laughs> Should I show you? No. Okay. Because oh, then it'll please. spark something else with Tibbs, and we just don't want to go there. <laughs> Camera. <clears throat> yeah, I. Uh, well, that's the other thing is I have uh, I've seen more penises in comedian group chats than in porn in my life. As they say, standard. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> I've taken more. I'm just kidding. Um. <laughs> no, finish that sentence, Bryce. <laughs> well, I, I didn't. Finish I, the I, plot. I, I'm trying to think if I've ever. Taking a dick pic. I don't remember. Nah. I don't really take that many pictures in general. I've had enough, like, alcohol experiences where, like, maybe I sent her one. I but it was my wife sure. if I did, and I was out of town. It's not like, hey, hey, I'm like, I think <laughs> sending one to your wife is like, it's like, just in case you forgot what this looks <laughs> like. <laughs> hey, dude, sometimes, man, like, when you're out of town and uh, you want to be reminded what... I feel like this is taking a turn that you're not going to be able to share with any of your... <laughs> <laughs> I think it's a healthy endeavor. I think so too. I think taking them is one thing. I think sending them is a whole different animal. Oh wait, wait, wait! You're practicing the angles. I'm just saying, penis appreciation, right? Well, body positivity, go, I guess, right? Go, go, let's go deeper into that. Well, that's a bad way to describe it, but <laughs> let's let's extend this. Nope, nope. Let's uh... keep them coming. You got one more. I know you do. <sighs> Seems like a long road to travel. Anyway, uh... <laughs> he's got jokes, folks. <sighs> I got a room full of comics. I got a high standard to live up to with you two savages. Any, what's your next? Like, would you, you got a show coming soon? Anybody? I, I just, yeah, I have. Um, I got into a festival. Uh, I'm in the World Series of Comedy, which I think isn't that the one that Andy like said sucked on your podcast when you had I don't him on. Remember? Um, but uh, no, I'm really excited about it. They do like the regional satellite shows, and if you do yeah. well enough there, they send you to like a national one. Nice. In St. Louis, so it's Where actually we... next week. I'm going up to Colorado Springs. Nice, I'm going to man. be performing there. And I just swung a deal in Provo. There's this place called the Hive Theater. Yeah, uh, and they're starting to do some shows. They're like they're in a theater, so they do like theatrical works and stuff. But their big thing that's been working for them is they have like one of those D and D comedy shows yeah kind of like what uh nds and those guys do up in yeah the or like a Harmon quest or like something like that i don't know if it's supposed to be like a comedy show or if it's just like a regular thing but they've started doing that and they've turned it into a web series uh and so they wanted us to write a bunch of stand-up shows around like different nerdy things so the next two weeks we're going to do like harry potter shows then we're going to do like a star wars show and then after the weekend of July 4th, so all your like jokes a Stranger Things about, show. Like Star Wars or Harry Potter? Is that what you're saying? Well, that's the theme of the show, right? So they're not necessarily all going to be about that, but that's going to be kind of the thread that ties everybody's set together. Right on. So, like, I, my buddy Daniel, he has a set that doesn't really, really about Harry Potter in and of itself. It's about how, like, he grew up in Zimbabwe, and a lot of people are very superstitious, and, like, how something like Harry Potter is received so differently in that culture, and how, like, he had one of these ants that thought it was like evil and wouldn't let him watch it and that kind of stuff. So he do, he talks about that and I think my set I, I'm working on a bit about how uh, Harry Potter's important as just like a cultural history of boys' haircuts in the Bush era, just <laughs> the evolution of like <laughs> wow. Yeah, I just <laughs> I just think specific. that's like a funny thing to like. I don't know. It's such this cultural touchstone and to like elevate its importance for the stupidest reason is like a funny premise for me. I'll, I'll see where it goes if it makes it into the final act, but I love it. that's what I'm excited about. I got the, uh, I'm doing the Adam Ray shows next weekend on the 21st and 22nd at the Jordan Landing Wise Guys. Good on you, man. Four shows come out. Check it out. Go to nice. BricePrescottComedy.com for the tickets. <laughs> Gotta get you on <laughs> my air horn. Gotta get you on the show, dude. <laughs> Mr. Tibbs. Yeah. Sneaky funny. Uh, yeah, Penny doesn't think so. <laughs> oh, well. Is that so? <laughs> hey, that is the name that cannot be said here. Oh, gotcha. it's a... I don't know. I've, I have a pretty, a fairly good relationship with everybody. I don't really have beef with anybody, but I know that... <laughs> that I know that some people... Did you, like, have a, a riff with her, or is it... Um, I'm gonna... Or just, you just don't this, like talking cons- about it? Considering... No, after we are done with this, I'll tell you what's up, but... Oh, I, yeah. uh, I... I had a moment that pissed me the fuck off, and I had to swallow it, and it, uh, and it just is what yeah. it is. That's I don't it. know. 
Yeah. But, I mean, you know me. I'm a pretty easygoing dude. I usually don't. Like, my my friends used to joke in high school that, like, for some reason, kids that, like, had problems with other people didn't have problems with me. Even, like, bullies. Like, people who would bully other people just wouldn't <laughs> bully me. Hmm. I think in part that's because I had better jokes about me than they did. That's, that's the you word, being that's, six four might have played a role into that too. Yeah, but once you know somebody, you know whether or not their physique is actually backed up by toughness. It's fair. Most people who know me know that I'm not a tough dude. Yeah. So are you? Uh, are you firing the list for Wednesday? Uh no. Did I'm you not submit an email? Yeah. So I hit or miss. I think I'm. Still that non-memorable that she's like, who's this guy again? So you should send her a picture from it's, the group it's chat. It's rough. They get so many emails. I would not. <laughs> I know. Want, it, yeah, I would. I do not envy having to be the one to like select who gets on that list. Well, I, no, I feel like a, she's that's trying a to be, rough job for sure. Yeah, yeah, I feel like she's trying to be pretty egalitarian about it and try to rotate through as many people. So yeah. Yeah. I love how Which, sweet you guys are. It's so, so nice. I know. The, the, are you going to show up at least and like, hang has, out? Has, oh, actually, so. I'm not going to be there this week. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a camping with my family. My daughter's birthday is on Thursday, so we're going to go camping at Lagoon. Good for you guys. Camping at Lagoon? Cool. Yeah. yeah. That sounds uh, like you're roughing it. Ominous, yeah. <laughs> I have a, if, if For those of you guys who are not in Utah that are listening, Lagoon is a theme park. Yeah. Uh, Lagoon is a lagoon. It's not a theme park. It masquerades as a theme park. <laughs> Have you never been to like a like a Six Flags or a Knott's Berry Farm? Dude, or, Lagoon uh, is if the fucking state fair didn't get its permit to move it when it was done. Exactly. Yeah, it's it's a, it's a low budget. It's like a great value brand. It charges way too much. Uh, Western family brand of a theme park. <laughs> Don't besmirch Western Dude, value. There we go. Lagoon is the Kroger brand of Disneyland. <laughs> Kroger brand Disneyland. So, I'm going to miss open mic. And I'm actually okay with it. Because, like, I I was, uh, it was crazy. Every now and then, like, I'll go back and, like, I'll go revisit old episodes of the show. Or, like, I, I take I take a lot of notes when it comes to different comedy stuff. Mm-hmm. Especially, like, after shows and things. And a lot of the, the chats that I had with Stevie Blue Eyes when he was here have been coming back up for me. And uh, <clears throat> why is this? I need to get this closer, man. New run through, I guess. <clears throat> Hold on. Turn that up a little bit. All right, much better. <clears throat> anyway, so, uh, and just the idea of like guarding your funny is important. That you have to. Uh... This is great. Okay. If you, like, when you first start, you just. You do every mic possible because you're just trying to get reps and get the feel of it and you get kicked in the dick a lot. Just sure. Because that's what happens when you do crappy mics all the time when you're not well, a when good you're comic. first starting out, like that's the only stage time you can get. I know, but this is, on, is this is this mics, is what I've been learning, know? and this is where I think this is where a lot of like the fluidity of that is questionable to me. Okay. So Define stage time. Basically, stage time means that you have a chance to perform your joke in front of a crowd in a venue that it would evoke a feeling of public displays of your whatever, right? Mm-hmm. So you go to a bar, you, you do your thing, you go to Wise Guys, do your thing, and it's it's there's a tension beforehand. There's an announcement, coming to the stage next, uh, and you go do it, and then there's a release when you're done, and it's like there's there's like this moment like... That's what, to me, stage time is. It's a practicing of a performance. It's putting pressure on your jokes in a public way so that you can kind of squeeze out what's good and what's not. You can fine-tune your performance. Um, You just get better at that. Well, a lot of the mics that we have gone to don't provide barely any of that. And so it's more of a, a camaraderie thing. You go to hang out with the guys, and yeah, you go up and do some yeah. stage time or whatever. It's a confidence building thing. Yeah. Right. But at the same time, like confidence is a currency and it is a comedian. Like you have to have it. And if you continually do things that shoot your confidence down, like it gets anyway, where I'm going with this is that like I'm actually my next my next show is in, you know, basically two weeks from no, it's ten days, twelve days, whatever. I'm the next time I get on stage will probably be next Monday night with the open mics. And so I'm like, but I've been writing and practicing. Like, I'm okay to like take a little bit of a breather just to kind of let some things like 
Because it's like yeah. recovery. Lab, I you always... Know? It's so funny. Even thinking about like some of the stuff that that we said the last time I was on the podcast. It's so... I'm becoming increasingly wary of like making definitive statements about like this is what comedy is like. Yeah, for sure. I don't know. I feel like the more I do it, well, the it's more individual I too. That, like, like it depends the, on who you are and like what your needs are as a person. Yeah, like so earlier today, like before we decided to do this, I was debating whether or not to go to an open mic tonight, just because you can get a little burnt out sometimes, especially if you go to the same one all the time and it's the same people and you hear the same stuff and like yeah. like you said like. There are times when it's useful and you need to do it because it's practice and you're working out new stuff or whatever the case may be. And there are other times where it's like, it would be better for me to use this time some other way. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I think a lot of what I've noticed is it's super hard for me to write when I'm not having regular life experiences to notice things. Sure. Like, you know, like when I'm in school, I'm hanging out with friends, I'm doing homework, I'm going to classes, I'm doing all of this stuff. And in that experience, you notice stuff, and that becomes the bones of of what you write. But as I've been graduating, like I'm, I still haven't started like regular work yet. I'm still looking for work, and so a lot of the day I'm just kind of doing nothing. Yeah, and it's like, well, what do you write based off that? Because you're you're not experiencing anything. Nothing's happening for you to notice or for you to think about. You're just kind of there. Well, and now so you get why other comics are inspired by porn and weed, because that's what they do all day. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I, I found it to be more... <clears throat> I found it to be more uh, helpful and applicable to my stand-up to do two mics in a night than yeah. to do one night mic and then take a couple days and do another one. Last week's a prime example. Wise Guys Mike, I was, uh, I, I was tweaking an existing premise that I had already done about, you know, having weird friends. And I told a different version of a story. I rearranged the version and that room was kind of weird as it was. Anyway, I was one of the last people. I think I went up like Mm -hmm. third to last. So the room was kind of exhausted anyway. And a lot of my set, like I didn't get a, I got a chuckle here and there, but I got, I got a laugh when I got on stage because I made fun of JD. I followed JD. Sure. And then I got a, 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 you know, a giggle here and there, but like, I didn't actually get a decent laugh until about two minutes, two and a half minutes in. Yeah. So you felt like you weren't satisfied. with Well, how it went or- well I felt, well, that's been one of my, one of my kind of goals is to be, I think that my, a lot of my challenges in comedy have come from the fact that I haven't been comfortable in silence. That like silence oh, okay. is when the funniness happens. Like when you can tell a joke and then just like, in silence, do an act out or a facial expression, or just kind of like that is almost like a Mario mushroom for laughs. Like you can let pe- like because it's it's more than just the words as a part of the performance. It's the whole thing. And so I've been trying to get better with like just letting that breathe. And so I found it to be good. They're like, okay, so that happened. Even though I would have wanted more laughs, I've been like ever since my show. I wanted to kill. I want to get better at killing in shorter distances. Like mm-hmm. do you know lot basically kill at open mics where it's like two to three minutes, five minutes where I can really get up and have the crowd riled up because everything's been bah, 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 without sacrificing, you know, my um, commitment to creating longer narratives through stories. So wise guys opening was fine. We were, we, I didn't, I didn't plan on going to the ice house mic afterwards. And then, you know, I was even talking to JD and he was like, well, we're going to go. And I'm like, yeah, I don't want to go. He's like, I don't want to go either. So we left and then I'm driving there and I'm like, yeah, fuck it. I'm going to go to the the ice house, mic." So I go to the mic and I get there and there was, you know, they did like a second round. Like after you guys left, because you and Courtney were there, they, they yeah. did another round of like four, four or five of us. Was that table there where the people were yeah. like calling out? After every single thing you said, were they still there by the time you got on They stage? were, but, but that was that was actually something that, like I was proud of in them because I get up there and like everybody was kind of like just nobody's paying attention. And I yeah. get up there and... <clears throat> well, and the I, game like, was just ending when I got, got Yeah, on. and, like, and I was like, like hey, minutes left in the game when I, got I, I just called it. I'm like, you guys are going to pay attention to me right now, aren't you? Like this is... Gonna be, you're going to laugh because this is what it's fucking for. Like I kind of made it a thing like, hey, this is my time. Like give it to me. Oh, okay. And like it, sh- it changes the dynamic of the room and I was able to do five or six minutes and I did some new and some old 
And I got some good laughs for the seven people that were there left or whatever. And at the end of it, like I f- like, and you know, tribe comes up to me. He's like, dude, you were the only one that did good at that, at that second round. Like that was great. And it was mm-hmm. like, okay, so I felt like I took what I learned at wise guys and I was able to like trim sure. the fat or whatever and do it better. You're like making those tweaks in real time. Right? Yeah. That, that's that why it's like cool to do multiple mics in a night. And that was, you yeah. know, I, I like that now that funk and dive is an hour later. It's harder to do the two on Monday. Like it used to be. Cause Getting back yeah. down from there, but do you ever go up to Ogden, Mike? Uh, this is yeah. Mike Thibodeau, by the way. He still is here. <laughs> I took a potty break. Had a uh oh. Had to make a number three. Don't ask about it. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I've been to it probably five, six times. I had a yeah pretty sour experience like the first time, so I took my which tail Mike to, uh, Funk and Dive. What was your sour experience? I made the mistake of engaging a heckler that was way too inebriated, oh. and she decided to pull up a chair, and I don't know if you Fair know enough. the format. It was like a yeah, yeah. two-foot-tall stage. Yeah, yeah. She pulls up a chair, and she's close enough to put her feet on the stage, and you got some jokes, big guy? Hmm. And then, like, <laughs> from there. So, oh. Yeah. It was a gong show too, and I got. Did gong- you ask her, "Hey, you feeling lucky? Because I could show oh, that's you right. something." They used, they used to do a gong show, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. I never made it up there when they were doing the gong show. You would have fared way better than I did. I got gonged off at like two minutes and thirty seconds. They didn't even give me the full like three minutes before oh, the gong. Brutal, oh dude. no way! Yeah. Right, and then the the heckler gets on, and she's probably eight or nine drinks past where she was when was I it got. That up. chick that was like the meth head that just got out of prison or whatever. No, the- she was actually funny. No, she wasn't, dude. She was ran- <laughs> sorry. No, it was funny, was funny to see her. Yeah. She was not funny. She was, it was like watching a like train that was on fire, barreling towards a school. Like it was like, oh my god, this is happening. Holy shit! So like, like she wasn't funny on purpose. Is no, what you're no, you're like. Well, so I, I used to work in a mental hospital for a couple of years. So I see people like that, and it like brings me back in a funny kind of way. So I get like a really dark level of humor out of that. Yeah, yeah, sure. So, but uh, yeah, it was really bad because I had the gong show. And then they open it up at the end. Does anyone else want to get up? Well, this lady, she's now several drinks past where she was. Now she's like five sheets to the wind. And uh, she gets up and I had snuck around. I got the gong in hand, ready to gong her. And then some lady gets up my face. You don't gong her. And she gave me that look like it's going to be a hate crime if you do. (laughs) And uh, I was like, it's just because she's the male equivalent of a cunt. Like, that's why. Like, I don't know. What is the male equivalent of a I don't know, but I assume it's worse. Why would it be worse? Because the male equivalent of anything's worse, right? Ah, uh, equality? Hello? We're <laughs> the same now. Uh, I'm just saying. The male equivalent of anything is worse. Yeah. Nah. That's the most 2019 sentence of this podcast. <laughs> I, I refuse think. to buy into that. <laughs> Which is the which is funny because that makes me the outlier to be like no nah, if we're equal we're equal but oh, you can't say that we're not really no, I, equal women are better thanks for ruining my joke <laughs> well, here's the thing though is that <laughs> I think it, uh, well, it, I thought, thought you were being like, like these... therapy sorry but yeah. I thought you were like wanting some sympathy for having getting gonged by the shitty uh, you know format up there I was just mad because like I couldn't gong her back and it wasn't because that she was a woman it wasn't because of anything it, it's because she was being shitty and she was a crap person. Sure. So yeah, yeah. I, I was looked at like, oh, you're banging her off because she's a woman and there's a lack of women in comedy. I'm like, no, like it's because she's Did she an asshole. Did she say that? There's a lack of women in comedy? This girl that came to her aid, pretty much, in so many words. That's, yeah, that that's does seem so gross to me. I feel like I have multiple friends who have stories of being heckled in Ogden and then other people come to the heckler's defense. I yeah. feel like... Because I well, do JD got, have a story like that? Well, too? yeah, but but his is his is involved and his one's his is just fucking crazy. But like, sure. there's a Alan Carter a while ago got in trouble because there was a show that he put on. I think it was at the Sand Trap where there was no women on the show, mm-hmm. and um, one of the local I don't know I don't know who it is. So I might be speaking out of turn. So if I'm sure if I'm spreading propaganda, please forgive. Mm-hmm. But supposedly one of the the uh, the local uh, female comedians was up there and kind of raised a stink and. Alan was drinking or something, and so it became a thing, and it you know it was a uh-huh. big. And the guy at the Sand Trap had to kind of deal with it. The owner, it was like a bad. Uh, yeah. They were they were worried they weren't going to be able to do another show there, and, and it was all based off of somebody complaining that there wasn't any women on the show. Yeah, I mean, I like it's no secret in the scene there are quite a few more dudes than there are women. So, but there are a lot of funny women in the scene. Absolutely, 
So yeah. I would, certainly wouldn't mind seeing him get some more opportunity, some more shine. Well, I, sure. lo- I, I love how, like, I don't see, I don't even, maybe I'm just fucking weird and old, but like, I think that I'm, I've, I'm a full believer in a meritocracy. If you're funny, you get a shot. Okay. Like to elevate a non funny person just cause she's got the right bits. That doesn't work. Like that doesn't, that's not good for mm-hmm. comedy. And I think that ultimately, like, when you talk to the really good female comedians on some level, like when you talk to them long enough and they, they, they agree, they won't openly admit that, but they would never want to lose their spot to somebody unfunny because of some sort of advantage that has nothing to do with their fun. Well, I, I also think, well, maybe I'm not the person to say this. Maybe somebody who's in this situation would know better than I would, but like, I imagine, like, I know a lot of female comics who are hilarious, and I don't think they would ever want to be like, wow, you're a really funny female comedian. Like, oh, they yeah, just want to be like, I'm a funny comic. Yeah, exactly. The same thing with clean comics. Like, I, I don't want to be told, like, you know, for a clean comic, you're pretty good. Like, yeah. you, you know, you want to just be funny. That's a great That's a great ad, because that is very applicable. Like, if you're funny, you're funny, regardless of if you're black, white, girl, clean, whatever. Like, funny's funny. Well, yeah, I, that's kind of the mantra I've repeated is funny respects funny. Yeah. You know, and that's, you know, in the, in the defense of the person who might've made that complaint, like there are a lot of funny, talented female comics who could have been booked on that show. I don't know if that person is like, doesn't know them or, you know, you never know. Like maybe you offered it to somebody and they weren't available. Like you never know why a, a given lineup is selected for a given night. There's a hundred things that could affect it. Well, and I think that it's, I don't ever think it's truly as nefarious as sometimes it's made out to be. I think it's more like, Hey, we're going to put on a show. Oh, cool. Can you put me on? Yeah, sweet. You're on the show. And instead of sure. being like, well, no, we need to make sure there's the proper, it's like more like this guy doesn't want to, have to sure. deal with who's on the show. Now he's like, ah, I got the list. It's good. I guess that would be the counter argument that person would make, right? Is that it doesn't need to be nefarious to have an undesired outcome. Right. Fair enough. Yeah. Yeah. No, fair enough. <laughs> Mike Thibodeau is still here, ladies and gentlemen. He's still uh, still sitting Sipping here. water. I feel hey, so John, bad let's, for let's pre- monopolizing this <laughs> no, no, conversation. Let's, no, let's, sorry, let's do this, John. Let's pretend like John, you and I are going to interview Mike. We're going to interview Mike? Yeah, we're like, uh, you know, I don't know. I'm Jimmy Fallon and, and you're, you know, Tariq or whatever. Like, you're in the band. Okay. So, uh... So that's the uh, first and only time I'd ever be compared to Black Thought from the Roots, but I'll take it. Yeah, dude. <laughs> you live a little, you'll be there. <laughs> dude, I love Black Thought. He's dude, the so Roots are good. The, they're so good, dude. He's so good. When yeah. he dropped that like ten minute freestyle, I just I went nuts for it. It was crazy, dude. The the fact that Jimmy Fallon landed the Roots for that gig is ridiculous. Yeah, yeah. who the, did he that was have such to a blow? good get? Yeah, yeah. dude. But, my, yeah. Some of my favorite. Did you ever see? When Dave Chappelle was on Fallon and he was talking about how he was up in like upstate New York or something and there was like a, the Roots were playing like a gig at the same city that night. Yeah. And, and like, like they thought, thought he was, was like the, the lost band. root. <laughs> <laughs> Damn it, man. Oh, man. Yeah. And he has jokes about Kanye West, too. Like that's one of my favorite Kanye West stories is Chappelle telling it on uh, on Fallon where he's like they're sitting there. Um, and all the people he name drops in his song are like in the room. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it was like for uh, to Lib Quali or something was they like Kanye gets a call, huh? Yeah, what? No, nah. why? Because I'm dope and I do dope shit. Click, <laughs> like just hangs up. On That's great. <laughs> anyway, but so yeah, I'd, be, uh, I'd be down to interview Mike. Let's do it. So Mike, Mike Thibodeau, uh, how long have you been into comedy, Michael? Uh, just about a year. Okay, so what does that mean? Just about a year. That's a- that means that I am not even to the don't put all your eggs in this basket. I'm in the probably shouldn't operate a basket with eggs in it phase of my comedy career. Okay, so that still isn't a number, but okay, I'll take it. <laughs> about a year. About That's a an year. interesting unit of measurement is yeah. how many egg basket metaphors. You know what I thought of, John? To my my, uh, my my lovely hour. We're co-hosting this event. Uh, I thought of missionaries and they say, I've been in about a year. And it's like, the, <laughs> they say, it's like, if you've been in 11 months, I've been in under a year. If you've been in 14 or 19 months, and you ah, assume anyone year. who's been doing it longer than you is older than you. If they have a crappy oh. haircut, they've been there a long time. Cause it's outgrown and they're yeah. you know long enough. Yeah. Unless they're in the States and they can get good haircuts, <laughs> but in Brazil, it's basically, but so about a year. Okay. So you started 
about the time Bryce started then. Yeah, just about. That's a- cool. April April of 2018? Uh, more like June or July. Okay. 2018. Okay. So like a year year. A year year. A calendar wow. year. Okay. A uh, Gregorian calendar year. Whoa. <laughs> Do you propose? I don't know why you saying Gregorian made me think circadian rhythm, but that does it. <laughs> totally probably thinking thing. that chant album that came out by those monks like twenty years ago. Wasn't that with? Why is the word ensign coming? Is it insignia? Ins- what was the name of that band? Enigma. Enigma. There it was. Yeah. Remember they had the trance. Yeah, yeah. It's like no, it wasn't the Halo theme song, but it was the. <laughs> Some gamers laughing somewhere right now. Let's listen to this. This is uh, what Mike Mike's act is about, by the way. It's Gregorian chants. He yeah. just gets up there. And- so, what's your uh, your end game with uh, with this Thanos? I don't have an end game. Everyone around me has like some kind of goal, and my yeah. goal is to just be funny in front of people. Like, I, uh, my favorite thing is going back. I record my sets and just listening to people laugh between my jokes. Like, that's my hobby. Okay, cool, man. So, I, I, ideally, I'd like to open for someone. Uh, I want to write jokes with Tyson Wood real bad. Why? Uh, I, I don't know. I Ginger dig- power! Dun, right, dun, dun. right. You get this like secret combination going on there. Like, yeah, you already have a handshake. I get it. Oh, it's a foot shake. It's really weird. It's better than a cough. <laughs> yeah, you got to take your shoes off and socks off. But uh, yeah, that's, uh, those are my two near-term goals. So you want to yeah. write jokes with Tyson Wood. That's one of your goals. <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. All right. right now, he's coming in his pants while he's hearing these. Oh he's like, my oh, gosh. my God. Oh, somebody <laughs> wants to write jokes. It's not his girlfriend. <laughs> he, his humor resonates with me. So I'm in the phase of my life where oh, I'm I raising love, kids. Dude. Love that yeah, guy. Yeah, and He's hilarious. His, his family stuff, not as dark as I would take it, but is super funny. Yeah. 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 So... Yeah, I, I, I gotta like be Tyson honest, man. I have a and hard he's, time. He's like, a great with, dude, too. In oh, addition yeah. to being funny. Well, and and that's yeah. that's how I was introduced. Like the whole uh, the old format of Wise Guys, where it was wait outside for three hours in the snow, kind of thing. Yeah. And mm-hmm. I got talking to him, and he was like the most genuinely friendly person right off the bat. I'm like, gives me hope for comedy. I like that. Yeah, he's yeah. a good dude. In a sea of catty people, there's Tyson Wood. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm trying to remember, like, I so I <laughs> when I first it was last summer, I I was in this habit of like, oh how I've <laughs> shifted out of this thought. <laughs> I used to like when I'd meet people, I was trying to be friends with everybody, and so I would like offer to take guys to lunch, you know. And me and Tyson met up for lunch one time. This was last summer. It was great. It was the start of like you know our budding bromance, <laughs> and. uh it was cool. I'm glad I did it. And I took a couple of some other people to lunch and other people like established comedians. I'm like, no, I got nothing for you, dude. Not like, as fun, huh? Not as fun. Wow. Not as uh, didn't want free meal, which is ironic because most comics are broke. So I was like, fine, I'll sure. keep my uh, free meal for somebody else. But that's the other thing, though, is a lot of comedians. It's not even I feel like I hear a lot of people like, oh, this person disrespected me or, or whatever. Like a lot of us are just awkward. I like, agree with that. A lot of us just don't know how to respond to people being kind to us. That's very true. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I, I try not. But like, it doesn't. It doesn't change not to the read fact too much that into that kind of. I stuff. get that, but it doesn't change the fact that when you're legitimately coming from a nice charitable place and somebody rejects you, that you're like, ah, cool. I'm so kind to the fact that he's just a weirdo. Like it's more like sure. you rejected me. I was trying to like, but I get what you're saying too. Like I yeah. I learned that a lot, actually, when I... The, actually, it became very... I remember um, talking about it on this podcast after I hosted the open mic for the first time. And, like, everybody was super nice to me because I was in a position to where they were going to go on the on the list. And I'm like, oh, I get it. These guys aren't all assholes. They're just weirdos. Like, okay. Right. And, like, I, I was able to kind of just right. temper and stop reading into this supposed hierarchy of the wise guys brass and all this nonsense that my boredom had created in my head about, you know, so you yeah. say there is no hierarchy? No, there is, but it's not like it's not like what you think. Like, yeah. And it's not as defined as what you think it is. Like even at even at people that like are regular openers and headliners <laughs> They have zero confidence in their standing within the whole thing. Like, it's not like, like, yeah, I can show. Like, sure. the only people that I know of that are, like, really cool with knowing they've got, you know, they're in is basically Spencer King and, you know, Travis Tate, maybe. And those Outside of those two, everybody else is like, yeah. 
And I don't even know, like the, the all the dry bar guys, like they're just on a different kind of thing. Like I was able to meet and hang out with Steve Solberg a little bit. He opened with me on the Jeff Dye show um, on Saturday at Jordan Landing, and he was cool. And like it was, it was cool to kind of get to know him a little bit better. But again, like he's he's just yeah. he's a road comic that's like just making yeah, his I like way. Steve a lot. Yeah, he's, he's awesome. So, yeah, to to your to your point, John, like in order to be good at comedy, it takes a sensitivity to the things that manifests itself in like social awkwardness that seems like a normal theme yes and a lot of that awareness comes from embodying it in real life that awkwardness <laughs> right it is true but i also have noticed this too like it it how do i say this without sounding like a dick you gotta get over that if you're gonna make a career out of it because like of the guys to some that, extent yeah of the guys that like i've been able to either been hanging out with at wise guys as far as like going and like just being able to be there or like opening or being a part of shows like the really successful guys they're not socially awkward at all like they're really gregarious at least not in that environment right yeah absolutely like they're they're they really fun in they're the club yeah. yeah they come back like they know how blessed they like it was so crazy like jeff die is an example tall handsome dude the chick's throw their cat at him like crazy, like ridiculous how much freaking tang this guy gets offered. And <laughs> felines and astronaut orange juice. I have yeah. no clue where this yeah, is. Yeah, I forgot I'm in a room with two Mormons. So <laughs> I love worry. how just any any word can be a euphemism now. Just any word. Ta- well <laughs> Let's describe it. So Tang is short for Poon Tang, which I, is a, okay. I know. It's just, <laughs> and Cat is a short for Feline, which is the nickname puts. Anyway, so. <laughs> I, I understand. Bro. Okay. So anyway, it's what I'm saying funny. is like, so we're standing outside after the show. And he's like, you have no idea how blessed we are, man. Like, do you kid me? He's like, I just got paid thousands of dollars to make a bunch of strangers laugh. And then I have women wanting to have sex with me. This is my job. I'm going to get found out, man. He was so like out of his mind happy that that was the life that he had. And like, that's a special dude. Like he's a he, th- sure. So I I get that. Like to to to. It's succeed. fun to work with a guy who's excited to be there in any industry. Well, yes, but but unpacking that on a bigger level, like Jeff dies legitimately successful. He's been on television. Sure. He's like a touring comic. He was third yeah. and last comic standing behind Marcus and Eliza. Like he's legit. It's a certain personality that can handle both the sensitivity of learning to have context to write good jokes, the skill set to be a great joke writer, and the social awareness to navigate things so you can get people to do you favors, which is exactly what it takes to be able to be truly sure. great in comedy. So to your point about having to have a, a, a particular personality, kind of getting back to our interview format. Yeah, Mike. Uh, <laughs> so Mike, what... Still here. Do you have a moment where you felt like you knew that you were funny? I've had plenty of moments like that. I've been on different scales and different stages. Uh, okay, yeah. I mean, yeah, uh, making family laugh, making friends laugh. I played a lot of sports growing up and through college, so I've been around a bunch of other people where you've got to navigate that social circle. And I've always gone with the <clears throat> comedic approach, but uh, sure. In this in this format, as a quote, air quote, you can't see me, a uh, comedian. That I don't know. Uh, I think I had. I don't even know if I can call it a set. I've exclusively done open mics. So sure. I had whatever an open mic equivalent of a set is. And I think I had a setup that was probably like two minutes long out of a three minute set. Mm. And uh, I, I got a roaring laugh with applause. And I was like, okay, I can resonate with strangers. And that was kind of one of yeah. That's like a big moment when that happens because like you're, it changes what your expectations are, right? Like a few years ago, if I got any laughs, I would count it as a success. Mm -hmm. Whereas now knowing that I'm capable of more, just getting a couple of chuckles, like isn't good enough for me. You know what I mean? Oh, that sounded really arrogant. I'm not, I don't mean it in that way, but like. I feel incredibly like, arrogant. I, what I mean by that is like when you, is actually when, when you is. break through, like <clears throat> when you break through that thing of like you get an applause break or you get like something big, it almost like it unlocks a confidence in yourself that raises what you expect out of yourself. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So that's cool. Man. What do you find funny? Uh, I find 
weird things funny. I, I, I like the repressed culture here in Utah, and I love poking fun at that. Okay. Um, yeah. I find a lot of the idiosyncratic approaches to things hilarious. Like what? Uh, it's a big word. JD's not understanding <laughs> that word at all. Uh, JD, a.k.a. I am Keto, the destroyer of all toilets. <laughs> that was a Hindu <laughs> quote. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Sorry. Shout out to our buddy JD if yeah. you're listening. If he's listening, yeah, he doesn't listen anymore. So I, I'm kind of in a weird space, right? This is like the Mormon Mecca, pretty much. Um, I don't identify that way, yet I worship that way, kind of. So I, I don't know what that means. So uh, here's a quote from my grandpa. He's Episcopal. Uh, he says, Mormons are like manure. Um, I like that quote. That's Oh, it's not finished. Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Brett. <laughs> Spread out. They can do much good. They can help things grow. But in one giant heap, they just stink. Um, it's very clever. I agree with that. I also identify with that. I see that part of the culture that I'm a part of mm-hmm. is very much like that. So, I don't know. That doesn't always resonate. Uh, I got called to do a talk once about three years ago at my ward, and <laughs> that was the one that assured me that never again would I be called. Really? <laughs> oh, you, you threw that quote in. Oh, baby. Yeah. yeah. Also, uh, so you're you're a active card toting member. Uh, I'm active in my own way, so uh, I have my own set of beliefs and whatever aligns. Yeah, that's great. So sure, there's certain things that I don't agree with all the time. Uh, okay. A lot of them are policy based, and that's fine. So okay. So well, we don't have to talk about this. I'm just curious because you've 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 really never taken a stand either way. You're just kind of like this ominous, like it's is that a, a fat z- joke. No, <laughs> the scales a stage could have been a fat joke, but we let it go. Like, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so it sounds like that's kind of one of your main inspirations is just what it's like living in this. Yeah, Utah is just such a weird monolithic you know, a Latter-day Saint culture. And sounds like that's kind of your main inspiration is how crazy some of it is. I mean, that's part of it. A lot of it is, uh, due to where I am in my life, you know, mid thirties. Uh, yeah. I've got kids that are young. I've got kids that are too young. That's a problem. I'm too old. <laughs> You're too to old have kids for how young your kids this are. Young, so yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's part of that. I have a, a darker side, like not like, ominous he's killing small animals kind of thing but right i i feel like anything can be funny and a lot of the most horrible things in the world there's some kind of turn there that you could make to get yeah. a laugh uh, my wife doesn't always appreciate that uh sometimes the crowds don't appreciate it but right you know. i feel like that's like a common thing that i've heard in guys that get into comedy at like older than i got into it is that it's like I've just had this side of my personality. I'm like done repressing it. And rather than like, <clears throat> it's almost like a Walter White thing where like instead of selling meth, I'm going to tell jokes well, it, to sort of, you know, scratch yeah. that itch to. Well, it's, it's healthy and it's cathartic. And I wish more people would take advantage of it. Like I'm, right. I'm all about people producing art, even if it's just for art's sake. I mean, it's redundant. That's the definition. But right. Yeah. Um, yeah like, I. I it invites introspection. People have to take evaluation of their life and then find out things that maybe they haven't discovered about themselves. They haven't thought about or analyzed. And that's really what I appreciate about the art. Yeah. No, I love that too. I think it's, I think getting in that headspace helps you not become stagnant as a person because you're always analyzing stuff. It can be a blessing and a curse because you can overthink things. I'm certainly an overthinker for sure, but I think one of the things, one of the reasons that I find hanging out with other comedians interesting is that they don't feel stagnant to me. They feel like they're always thinking about stuff. They feel like they're always evolving, which is cool. Sounds like Matt Tribe. <laughs> that guy's a thinker. He is. Matt's Matt's a smart dude. Oh yeah, yeah. And he'll. That's. I think one of the things about him that makes me laugh is he has knowledge in areas that other people just don't and he treats it as if like how is it that not everyone knows this bees yeah <laughs> colony is, collapse disorder how is no one talking about colony <laughs> collapse disorder <laughs> and just his his general like shock at how 
the like specific knowledge he has is not general. It's kind of relatable on some on some level, but it just makes me laugh. It just tickles me. I love that guy. <laughs> oh, it tickles you. It, t- it tickles me. Yeah, that's so cute. <laughs> It's been cool to see Matt get some opportunities because he's his comedy's gotten a lot better lately, mm-hmm. and uh, he's now getting in front of real crowds. Like he's doing some opening gigs yeah. and stuff, and and I know he's he's smart enough as a comic and as a person to 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 take the experiences of that and the pressure of it to refine. Like I've already seen him do it mm-hmm. in a small way, and it's super exciting. He's one of those guys that's just so uniquely him, and so just lovable as a person. There's no angst or guile in Matt. Like even when he's mad, even when he's mad, it's like funny. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. I feel like it's almost like people, it takes people a while. It takes people like a while to realize how like sincere he is. Yeah. Because he does have like so much energy that like, it takes people a while to realize, Oh, that's like, he's just completely being himself, you know? I'm glad that he tones it down for me every now and then. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Dang. I I think, like, half of this episode is just going to be us be like, let's pick one of our friends and talk about all the things we love about them. (laughs) Which I'm totally down for. (laughs) Well, I love the... That's one of the things that's cool about our little comedy bus group is that we have... uh, we, we, We do have a concern for one another that's different. And there's a love and appreciation there. And... Yeah, and uh, kind of like I said yesterday, like it's it's not self serving. Like there's, we'll go to bat for each other if we need to, and sure, <clears throat> that's something that's needed. I I've uh, yeah, it's been it's been an awkward experience. I've been re- pretty introspective over the last couple ever since my show, like really just you know analyzing, looking for different angles, and looking to understand and everything and. <clears throat> how to be better at this whole thing, how to navigate the scene better, how to create more dynamic relationships, how to shed the ones that I don't care about that aren't serving, you know? And, uh, it's an interesting thing. Like comedians are, they're genuinely good people, I think. And they're awkward and weird. And, uh, sometimes just the puzzle pieces don't fit to have certain relationships work. And you just got to kind of deal with it instead of keep trying right. to jam these pieces together. Just be like, yeah, you know what? On to the next one. And that's hard for a lot of people, especially in 2019 when we're all fuzzy and supposed to be nice and love everybody. Like sometimes it's not going to jive. Just move on, be done. So what's your what's your threshold with severing a relationship? Is it I've had too it's many not negative so, experiences? It's not so much severing; it's more apathy. Okay, like I had that, a that to me is severing. Okay, if you're well, well, towards someone. Well, I, I had a, and I'm not going to say names, but if I described it enough, you guys know who I'm talking about. I had a recent experience when when I. It's it been devolving. There was somebody in the scene that I was friends with from the beginning that was really open and nice to me, and and I backed them. And and uh, this person, somewhat of a polarizing figure in the in the scene, people either like him or they don't. And uh, you know, I'd done some gigs with this person and everything, and then I start getting shows and stuff, and started to freeze out. And then when I got my headlining gig, like legit, started talking shit about me, and. Uh, I erroneously thought that he represented two other people's opinions as well. And so I reached out to the one in anger and said, like, basically, you know, like, thanks for showing me your true colors on this. Like, I'm out. Like, you could have been a man about it and talked to me personally, but you decided not to. So whatever. And immediately this person reached back out to me. We were able to talk about it and came to find out that this one other person's opinion was isolated. It wasn't, you know, the whole thing. It's just that these guys didn't have the (laughs) communication skills to, like, handle jealousy, which is what it is. And at this point, like, the guy's dead to me. Fuck that guy. Like, I don't care. I have nothing. I have no interest or desire to try to feed a relationship that is not built on fertile soil so like that to me is like and i can't this person can add nothing to my life like anything that i would give back would just be unrequited so i'm like yeah okay i'm done Hmm. yeah but that's after a year like that's not like just you know something i'm like five minutes in and then i'm just snipping it you know and that's a that's a very extreme case as well like on the other side there's there's other people that i've tried to like connect with and I've just felt like they don't have an interest in connecting with me. And then I put myself in their shoes. And like, I have such a weird, and I recognize this about myself. I have such a, a weird prism. When you, when you look at Bryce 
as a person as a comic as a whatever with all the things i'm involved in it's like looking at a prism it's like the light fracks into a bunch of different areas to where you're like what am i who who and what is this guy really and to some people i think it could be too much like this i don't yeah and it just nah the fuck the old guy like i don't want to deal with him <laughs> so <laughs> okay <laughs> i just kind of you know yeah and i i, I that that's a lot of the more younger crowd i think but mm-hmm. i obviously overanalyze a lot of this stuff too so yeah and i think well like so like the two of you have very different visions for like what you want like sounds like mike you kind of more it's just like a something that you enjoy doing not necessarily something you see as like a career path so i think i feel like in a way there's there's a lot of value in that and that it's it's easier to avoid conflict there you know because that same thing that you were talking about bryce where there's like almost this this uh, this idea of competition, even if it's not direct competition, like it exists less when it's, when you're in it for, you know, just wanting to have fun and like develop a skill and like enjoy yourself. Yeah. I, yeah, that's, that's true. And I, I also am self-aware enough to know that sometimes it puts people off when like you are very clear about what you want and you vocalize it. Like that's hard for people. Like who's this arrogant dude? Like what? (laughs) Yeah, but the irony of it that is is that that's how successful people achieve hard things mm-hmm. is by being clear about what they want and then reverse engineering the steps to get there. And so I'm looking at you know what this is my next step. Okay, that's where my attention goes. It's very scientific how you get to certain levels of life in any aspect of life, whether it be money or relationships or comedy or whatever. Like the there is no wheel to reinvent here. You want to get to a certain area as a comedian? There's somebody that's already done it that you can look at and go, how did he do it? Okay, and then reverse engineer it. And most of the time, it requires a lot of hard work, and it requires pissing some people off along the way, and it requires you to have a real set of thick, like some real thick skin. And, okay. Well, I feel like I'm kind of in the middle of the spectrum, right? Where it's like... You're on the spectrum? (laughs) Maybe, I don't know. Uh, But... Whereas, like, you feel like your goal is more, more of I don't want to say necessarily a hobby, but for lack of a better term, you do it for the love of it. Whereas you also have like these professional aspirations. I feel like I'm transitioning from doing it as an amateur to trying to to do it as a professional. Yeah, like, I feel like I'm in that sort of transitional mode, not only in terms of like how I how I go about performing and writing, but also how I go about thinking about it. Yeah, you know what I mean. And so it's an interesting transition, you know, at what point do you start thinking of yourself as a professional, you know, at what point do you start like, well, as your friend, John, if I were you, I would say that point was yesterday. Like you already are a pro. And the moment that you, you embody that as a part of your identity is, will be when things start to shift for you. Like that's just, that's just one of those success principles and it's going to be as again as your friend it's going to be interesting because you do have limited life experience as a younger college person you're just graduating now like right you've never legitimately let somebody down <laughs> i mean other than your family i'm just kidding <laughs> <laughs> but uh I, i'm joking obviously and, and like there's a lot of things that just come like you know i've i've been bankrupt watch, i've watch lost people money, money. Like my parents I've, call and be like he's not joking he's not jo- <laughs> we're very disappointed I'd be, in him. i'd be oh flabbergasted they listen to the show um the point i'm getting at is there's going to come a point in and this is probably why um not that there's been tension in our friendship ever but there's like been like a weird kind of edges of like well how to like bryce and john like i've been aware of it anyway like i don't have any issue well, with yeah it ever. We, I, like we see it a little bit differently like we see how we go about trying to make things happen in a different way sure sure you know so I, sure. I see that as you there's going to come a point here real. I mean, you're going to a comedy festival next week. Like there's going to come a point sure. where you're going to have within your grasp something you really, really want. And it's going to require you to do something that is uncomfortable for you to do. That's that's you claiming your brilliance because you are a brilliant comedian. Mm-hmm. And that to me will be the most interesting like perspective viewing it from the outside better than any set I could watch you. Cause that's where like the rubber meets the road when it comes to like really getting what you want. Yeah. There's always a, uh, you're actually not the only person to have noticed this too, that like there is this, I feel like a lot of people that I know and a lot of comedians are like, when's John just going to unleash the Kraken? Like when is he just going <laughs> to, yeah, 
and I don't even necessarily mean from a from a. Is that a uh, euphemism? Because uh, you brought up that word before. You can you can interpret it however you will, but I mean <laughs> not only from the from the perspective of professional ambition, but also from the perspective of like not being afraid to just go there. Yeah, and not being afraid to like piss people off and say stuff that people don't. You will be able hear. to add a true ethical dilemma to your joke. It's true. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm living a real ethical dilemma right now, which is what is know. that? I'm I'm curious. What's your ethical dilemma that you're living now? Well, it's the on the one hand, there's this idea of self as a nice, good person, and then there's this idea of something that could be really funny if you said it out loud, right? Well, I, that's I okay, that so I that's that's one aspect of, but I'm talking more about the idea of. Like jealousy interfering in relationships that you have because you're better oh. than somebody. Where you get an opportunity because you've earned it better, but you haven't been nearly as like uh, ambitious about it. And sure. that could. Which I think is one of the reasons I haven't had, had a ton of conflict yet, right? Is that. True, I but that, that'll either change or you'll be in the middle. Sure. And you're too good to not be at the top. Like. Well, it, thanks. That's very nice. This, this is like. I'm not trying to jerk you off here, but like one of the things <laughs> I will say this, this is, this is good radio. As one of the things like really suggestive hand movement. Yeah. We, we uh, switch from interview of Mike to intervention. Yeah, so in Mike, me. it's your turn to pop up since you're, you're, you gave I yourself. I like this a, format where, where two of us just kind of. <laughs> yeah. I can't yeah. wait for you guys to turn on me. That'll be great. I'll be like, Hey, shut up. Um, <laughs> so, uh, go back to church, Bryce. <laughs> Never until I do, I guess. But um, what was I going to say? It was uh, okay. A little technical difficulty there, but I'm back. This is what uh, where I was going with this. Um, I I get bugged when everybody fawn. I just did it, which is ironic. I get bugged when everybody fawns over how brilliant you are as a comedian. Because not that you aren't, because you literally are. Mm -hmm. But because I think that it sets a precedent for you that could be painful later because when right, like, like being content with praise no 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 and not with success no being or? used to it and mm -hmm. even even needing it at a certain level mm -hmm. and when you like you're like i said you're going to this comedy festival you're gonna there's gonna be fucking killers that are there and you're yeah. gonna be one of them and so it's gonna be a different level when people are like yeah john your set was a seven out of a ten and they're good jokes like and they're real they're at a higher level critical of your jokes instead of like oh my god that was the funniest thing i've ever heard sure and so so uh what's well, that idea of transition that i was talking about yeah like, well that idea of like where before it was <laughs> i watched just repeat a transition in fucking british or whatever like, uh, <laughs> no but like that idea of like a transition from like an amateur to a professional that's kind of what i'm getting at yes yeah. is, is learning to have those higher expectations of myself well that's that's why it bothers me when i hit because i already see you at that level it's like john doesn't need to be f like filleted he needs to like have real like true support like constructive criticism mm -hmm. how to you're a killer joke writer obviously you have a, a keen mind of this but there's other things that could enhance like the performance aspect of it that i don't think everybody thinks because in the scene you're one of the best that is here nobody would be willing to have that level of of critique with you because it's not first of all invited but at the same time like it's yeah. just it, it's it's although like, i'd like to think that i'm not all that intimidating like if somebody it's not about that. that it's about respect like it's it's yeah. a thing where it's like if I'm at a lower level than you, it's 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 a weird thing. Like if I'm at a lower level than you as a comedian and I see something that you can improve on, it's a dick move unless I'm at a really close friendship level with you to be like, dude, if you'd try this a bit. And I know for myself, like I don't I haven't felt that way as far as close. I mean, I feel like we're friends. We're good. And everything, but like I haven't sure. felt like, you know, we're boys texting each other back and forth yet. So it's like I right. see this, and then everybody else around's like, "Oh my God, John's so fucking amazing!" Ah! And I'm like, "Yeah, he's great." Okay, what's what's gonna get <laughs> that? Doesn't get him to the next level. Like John needs to be prepared for shit that has nothing to do with comedy to be to thrive at the next level because you have the chops to get there. It's like on a, on the flip side, look with me. I feel like 
I get that all that other stuff. Like I'm working on the chops part. Like I get the chops of comedy. It's fucking game mm-hmm. over, dude. Like I, I know how to navigate the business side of comedy. I know how to yeah. navigate pissing people off because I want it more than they do. Like I've right. lived my entire life in a competitive nature with real estate and all the other stuff that I've done in my life where it's been like, there's a winner and a loser. It's not like kumbaya, like somebody's going to lose and I want to be the winner. So that has collateral damage. Like I'm okay with that. But I need to be a better joke writer. So I look at you and I'm like, you got the chops already. Let's get the other stuff. Let's get figuring out how to. Yeah. And I guess this is kind of where you and I slightly see like that professional progression differently where like, I feel like, yes, I'm at a point where I consistently do well on open mics and I do well at certain types of shows, but like, to me because, and maybe this is a function of me just having more time than you do because I'm 26 and I don't have a family and I don't have those other responsibilities at this point in my life that you know about. Okay. Right. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so think, the way that I, the way that I view it. it is that like the, the way I view it is I definitely know that I have like a, a certain amount of talent and ability, but I want to, I want to have, I want to get to the point where before I start trying to get a special, I could walk in tomorrow and do one. You know what I mean? So like I, I'm, I'm happy with a lot of the stuff I've written, um, but I don't think it's there yet. I don't think it's where I want it to be yet. Which isn't to say that I don't think that I, that I'm. I, it's just, it's not to say that I don't think that I'm any good. It's that there's a difference between doing well and being at the level that I want to be at. Right, but but here's here's I where I will here's where I will rebut sort of a portion tackling of that, that other part. Okay, here's where I will rebut a portion of that. Yeah. And this is where ambition comes in to help you. Sure. Sometimes having a little bit of fear that you might fuck up is exactly what you need to raise your game to the level to where you don't. I mean, I guess there is something to be said for that, for sure. So when Keith is again personal experience here, that's all I can speak from is my own experience. When Keith asked me if I wanted a headline, I legitimately felt fear because I knew that I had about 50 to 55 and I knew only 25 or 30 of it was actually good mm-hmm. and that I was only going to have two weeks to try to make that other stuff good enough to where I didn't embarrass myself. But right. I also knew that there was a muscle that can only be learned in a headlining format and right. that that muscle is going to translate into me being better at open mics, me being better in writing jokes, me bridging a narrative together for longer sets. Mm-hmm. And so it's like getting under that squat bar when you don't know if you're going to be able to push up all that weight. Sure. And I felt like I did great. And I, and I, I, I could have done way better for sure, but I do not regret the decision. Scared the shit out of me. Sure. Lost sleep. Well, and you also have enough confidence in yourself that you know that that's not going to be the last time you have an opportunity. But hold on, like though. Right. Not necessarily, dude. Like, there's a difference between having confidence and just, fuck it, let's do it. I don't... Mm-hmm. If we're being real, I don't have a ton of confidence in myself as a comedian. Like, I still get fucking scared when I go to open mic that I'm going to embarrass myself. When I write jokes, I, I wonder sometimes if I really do have a gauge of what's truly funny. Where I feel like I'm, what keeps me going back to that well, though, is that I know that you put me in a room of people, I can make them laugh. In a format that's not on stage. And so that I know if I at least have that muscle, that I can figure out the other stuff. And if I look like an idiot for a long, like every time I hear of a successful comedian talk about the beginnings of their career, they say, yeah, I sucked for two years. I bombed a lot. What do you got to do to be a comedian at the beginning? You got to bomb a lot. So I'm like, okay, well, I'm just, these are pieces to the puzzle that they've showed me. Okay. And if it makes me look stupid and people judge me and they think that I'm preemptively jumping on stage when I shouldn't be, that's on them. But like for some guy like you, I think it'd be great to be like, dude, you're headlining in two weeks. Figure it out. Sure. Figure out how to fill that room. Figure out how to get your set going because then all of a sudden you're thinking about this in a very real, intense way that's going to heighten your game because you're already a killer, dude. And it's same with you, Mike, dude. Like, you're not having a goal. That is that is a bigger issue. Like, you're fucking hilarious. Like, when when, when I, my first thought when you said, I just want to open or whatever, I'm like, hmm, okay, maybe I could pay Mike to write jokes for me. Like, because <laughs> not like, not like, not that I want to have like a joke writer like that, but it's like, how can I get Mike to like have some sort of urgency with his gift? Because you're hilarious, dude. Like, this, the jokes that you come up with and everything, it's like, that's your. Well, it's not, it's not a sense of urgency. It's 
my life is balanced differently than yours. I get that, but that's a choice, though. <clears throat> it's like, it's one of those things where... I'll tell my wife and kids, but like, eh, no, comedy's no, no, taking I, I don't know that it's an, an invalid choice if, that, if that's what you want. But the one thing that where I will agree with Bryce on this is that, like, I think there are a lot of people who don't realize how good you are. And like that's the, the thing that is, is kind when of we sad, say you're like, sneaky I, funny I really, it's not that you're quiet and you sneak up on us it's that like <laughs> I mean you that don't too because you are a, a good listener um, and I feel bad I've been dominating this conversation not letting you talk but yeah Bryce is right that like I feel like there are a lot of people that don't realize how funny you are and like I think you've written some stuff that I think is great clever you know? smart hilarious and like it's in and I'm not knocking your decision to sure. do it. like that. It's more of just like I want as a fan. I'm like, oh, come on, man! Like I yeah. want more Mike. I like that. Sure. I actually see it as a positive thing for me because it it makes me want to elevate my writing, my delivery, my practice, so that I get to the point where I can't be ignored. So that's that's kind of where I'm at. Yeah, so. that makes sense. That's kind of how I feel as well. That like. I want the. I almost to get want, to that, I almost not, want the it's, first it's thing messy. people to. You have to be crappy to get to that. I point know. There. I'm getting my crap out right now. Yeah, but I, <laughs> oh, that's the thing. Is like I feel like I want the noises. first. <laughs> I want the first encounter people have with me to be what I do on stage, which is why it's, it's not like I don't ask for time. It's not like I don't do shows. You know what I mean? But I want the first thing that comes to mind when people think of me to be what they see on stage because that's what I have the most confidence in and yeah. that's what I feel like I'm the, the most proud of like I you're right like I I don't really have a brand to speak of and that's definitely something that I need to work on uh, but until I figure out what my direction even would want to be going there I am content at least for the moment to sort of let the the act speak for itself that's fair you know? and I, you're right in that there's going to come a point where that's not going to be enough anymore um, but I feel like that's my way of playing the long game. Sure. You know? Well, I hope, I hope as I share my feelings and experiences on this, it's not coming across overbearing or judgmental because everybody's got I'm their own path or whatever. All, no. Like, uh, and, and, and I, I made plenty of mistakes in comedy already and I get oh, it. Sure. I'm not, I'm not perfect, but yeah, I do. I do favor. And, Isn't it crazy how, it's so funny. It's so fascinating to me how much time I think of. I think about just like the idea of comedy and just like the whole experience of it. Like I feel like I think about that so much, and I wonder it's if because you like, don't jerk people... off, dude. Like, you got more time to <laughs> <laughs> goes down to BYU, lays under a tree on the quad, and dude, roommates. comedy is his porn. He's like, oh, if I could. <laughs> The way Chappelle wrote that joke and the transition, oh, it's so sexy. <laughs> there are worse vices to have, man. There's, it's true. Absolutely true. You know? But I, I've noticed that with a lot of, of comics that I know. That, like, it's funny. I don't, even people who are super passionate about their professions, like, I know a lot of teachers, and when they're off the clock, they don't think about teaching as much as I think about comedy. You know? Or, I think that'll change, dude. I honestly would. Because I think that what'll happen is you'll. It will get into a loop. Like I've I've been finding for myself lately that I, I I've stopped watching as much comedy as I used to because right. I found myself like picking up ticks and emulating of those comics in a way that's not original. And so in order for me to like find inspiration, like I'll watch documentaries and TV and shit, and then I'll like have like my phone out while I'm watching that. Like oh that's a funny idea. What that like I got I've been working on some Formula One bits. They're great that like I got by watching a Formula One documentary, right? Like I feel okay kind of pulling from that where if I watch Bill Burr. So you think that's like a linear thing where it's going to decrease more and more over time? Or do you think it's like a cyclical thing? I think cyclical. I think is once because like I think that the reason why I'm in this space right now is that like I feel I feel pressure after my show to write more and to write better. Right. And so what's the next thing? Yeah. And so I'm like, Mm -hmm. okay, so where do I get inspired inspired? with clever angular takes on things that aren't normal and, I, and again i just i where i do look at other comics and i find myself consuming more as podcasts where it's like they're not doing bits but they're talking like i started noticing this trend with delia like i listen to him every week when he comes out he talks about oh, i was watching this documentary and, 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 and then we talk about something funny in the documentary and i'm like he just gave me the map dude documentaries are great fodder for crazy ideas 
And who's the one guy we were just talking about that we say is smarter than we know than we care to admit? Matt Tribe. Right. He gets all all his shit's documentary shit. <laughs> Bees and serial killers over mass shooters. Like this is all stuff that like ideas can come to you with. Also, I feel like Matt Tribe is what I imagine documentary filmmakers are like. <laughs> Probably do. Because you just pick a topic that like nobody thinks about and just an hour and a half of just knowing, knowing it and obsessing over it. And it's similar in some ways to like writing like a like an hour long show on something, right? Yeah. But like when I think of like who's the person that would make a documentary about Formula One, I just think of like the racing equivalent of Matt Tribe. Like you know <laughs> what I mean? Like like Matt to me, like if he if he weren't a comedian, he would be a documentary filmmaker. Well, I think that if I, I think that because he speaks Spanish and the way that he looks, he's probably already like an ayahuasca shaman somewhere. I hope so. Like yeah. level four Reiki healer. Probably. <laughs> I'm going to, I'm going to do a, we're going to do a session from a distance, dude. Every time you might think about funny fact, my dad is a level four, uh, he's a level three Reiki master. No way. Yeah. It might, he would meet him and be like, there's no fucking way this guy's a Reiki guy, but, and he hasn't yeah. done it in years, but he used to teach no, massage. I used to take uh, voice lessons. Like when I was in high school, I used to take singing lessons and my singing teacher, she was into that and. She's into like I said. I think she was into essential oils too. Oof, of course, like, there's a lot of that. There's ways to make money with essential oils. <laughs> I uh, fast and loose. <laughs> you ever heard my thing about how I want to start an optional oils company? <laughs> <laughs> Do tell. It's like your oils. They smell nice. You can use them or not. It's not like essential. It's <laughs> they're optional oils. I love it. It's just like a more honest version of essential oils. <laughs> That's a great bit, actually. There's literally an essential oil called Thebes. Like, they're, they're not even... Like, the locale in Egypt? No, no, no. Like, thieves, as in people who steal stuff. Oh. Yeah. It smells like a carnival. It's like... It's almost like, okay, truth in advertising. <laughs> you know? But I don't know. I mean, I've... In the defense of the people who are always talking about it, like, I actually haven't tried them. You know? But... I always feel like one of the, the reasons I don't is that the people, like, the claims people make of what essential oils do don't seem consistent. Like, all the people seem to think they do different things. You know? I think essential oils, uh, if there was a, you know, like a sugar pill test on an experiment, that essential oils have way more sugar pills in their, uh, <laughs> in their control group than, <laughs> than a normal experiment. <laughs> man, it could be, man. <laughs> well, because there's, there's a lot of... A lot of benefits that are attributed to to essential oils that you can get just by deep meditation. Sure. Okay, so if I meditate with my essential oils, the lavender will open up my third eye and help. Nah, nah, yeah. Nah, nah. They smell nice though. Some of them. Some oh, yeah, smell really good. Yeah, it's like walking into Victoria's Secret. <laughs> <laughs> do people use them Speaking as like of cologne? Thieves. Just kidding. <laughs> do, do people? I don't use know them enough like about them. Like. I hear people making jokes about essential oils a lot. Well, dude, in like the life... it's Utah, and like yeah. a lot of people do, but like I actually know very little about it. In the life coaching kind of community with other coaches that do similar things to what I do, there's a, there's a kind of a branch off where there's some fucking weirdos, man. Like where they're into like really like deep trance, meditation, spiritual stuff that's manifesting. Like it's... It's not based in any real world principle. It's like, have you guys heard of this thing called channeling? No. Okay, dude. So there's, I think it's called channeling. Yeah, it's called channeling. So basically there's this idea that like, you know, the universe is supreme intelligence or um, supreme intelligence. Sounds like I'm fucking like Star Wars or something. <laughs> um, not supreme intelligence. The... Infinite intelligence. That's what it is. That it's like, you know, the, the universe, God, source, whatever. It's like this 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 giant consciousness that right. there's doorways into tapping into. That, that, like, it's a very real thing that there is no unanswered question. There's just a question we haven't asked. Right? So, so it's it, the answer exists. We just have to tap into it through these different channels of our awareness, through infinite intelligence. All right. And the ways that, you know, there's, you know, 
law of attraction is a part of it, like thoughts connecting with that, like being clear about what you want, this whole kind of idea of in your mind forming this idea of where exactly you want to go and then, you know, acting as if you go there. But this channeling thing is fucking weird because there are these people that like legitimately say that they're like tapping into the consciousness and they will embody a new person and then like t- almost like possession type shit where it's like okay john isn't john now he's tapping and he's like there's a guy i'll show you guys a video after it's like this. halfway between possession and self-identifying kind of well like there's this guy okay so there's this one dude his name's bashar right this okay. was the first exposure i got to it a long time ago by a business partner of mine so this bashar character is supposedly an interdimensional alien that is from the future that's here to like help us out and this this guy this his name's paul anka or paul something Paul Anka, like he's. <laughs> <laughs> I can't keep my eyes off. Of you. That's the wrong guy. That's Frankie Valley. Anyway, so he like embodies like he'll be there and he's like you know this Paul guy's like this normal guy and then he'll like sit in his chair and he'll do this like <laughs> and then all of a sudden he will don a new a new accent and when you ask him questions he will do it like he, it's no way trippy shit. But here's where it fucks with you. Is he? I, my question is: Is he turning a buck? Is it? 100 bucks. He He's be in my poor seminar. as sh- Well, he, he charges for this stuff, but this guy's not rich at all. Like, it's more like sustenance type stuff. Like, where he's like, I can't sleep in the, my car, so I'm going to charge 20 bucks for this. Like, he's... Yeah, it's not like a Tony Robbins level thing where he's like, oh, yeah, yeah, pay me 10 grand and I'll, you know... The ter- and this I'll be whoever you want me this to isn't be. <laughs> this isn't Whoopi Goldberg in Ghost, okay? Like, this is, this is like, just a different level. So anyway, he'll do this. He'll this talk is more like to- Whoopi Goldberg on the View. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, but but here's where it gets trippy: is like the shit that he says is really insightful. Hmm. And no when way. you and when you think about it, you're like, whoa! Like that. Like it. There's been times where I've been watching this guy, and and like, nah, fuck that. Nah. And I'm, I'm like, I'm, I'm rejecting the mechanism. It's coming. Cause it's like this guy's right. uh, he's making shit up, whatever. He's, this is Halloween. Like he's just dressing up for a second. Like this right, it just seems guy. like it wouldn't be real. Yeah, and then he'll say this really like impactful stuff, and you're like, wait a sec, is this guy full of shit or is he? And it fucks with you a little bit. And then I like the times where I've taken something positive from it. I'd be like, actually, you know, I don't care. I'm gonna take the content for what it is. Like I don't have to believe everything that's written in the Quran to like take a clip out and be inspired by it. So, okay. right. It's like if you have a bowl of raisin bran. You can always yeah. pick out. The I was going to use mine. Conf, the that's a flakes. bad always example. You know, raisins. I was going to use mine. Conf. I don't have to believe yeah, that would have been a bad example, but <laughs> that would have been a very so, bad example. I believe in struggles, you know, but there's a, but there's, there's even other <laughs> people like think, there's this. What's mine? Comp, you know, <laughs> <laughs> oh, my I was like, God, what, what are the comps that I'm just not, Recognize? <laughs> well, dude, that's, that's so terrible. I'm so sorry, <laughs> dude. There was a I watched like there was this like some conservative pundit that decided yeah. like they took quotes from Mein Kampf and they, oh, they attributed they... to the Quran. <laughs> oh, I thought you were going to talk about the guys who they wrote like these academic papers and they took took selections from Mein Kampf. Oh yeah, that same and, same and, group, and they, dude. Yeah, yeah, and they just took everywhere where it says Jews and they put like white men and yeah. they like submitted it. It didn't wind up getting that one didn't wind up getting published, but like. They also didn't catch that that's what they were doing. In Dude, those guys review. were on Rogan, and the, they, they told the entire story of everything. They had, like, six papers published by by universities that were such nonsense. That were, yeah. li- like, there was one talking about rape culture at dog parks because the male dogs were dominantly, like, were forcing like themselves the apart. Dogs. And they yeah. were saying how, that as owners, we <clears throat> needed to let the dogs fuck us so that there's a new dynamic. Like, these are, these are some, the papers yeah, that these guys like are writing. <laughs> But like totally the, mocking the entire like profession of the way that academia is, and then yeah. the, and the, some of these guys are like, well, well, if you just change this world, we'll be able to publish it. And then when they got got, like they had to, like all these universities were having to retract everything yeah. as quick as possible. But it's and according to the guys, and like I mean, I haven't heard the other side of the story, so take it with a grain of salt. But like according to the guys, like this when they sent it off to like the peer review, instead of saying like, hey, this is silly. They like made it more absurd. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So like the same thing with like when they set the Mein Kampf paper off, like they didn't tell them, hey, these sound like vaguely Nazi-ish ideas. They're like, hey, you're not problematizing this enough about white people. Yeah. So like luckily that one didn't wind up getting published, right? But 
like things like that in their other papers where instead of like picking apart like this is silly and that you're clearly playing a joke on us they're like no 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 take it further though <laughs> no could you yeah. like could you imagine the mindset of a person who's reading a paper to be peer reviewed about the concept of rape culture at the dog park like what a time to be alive nature's full of rape dude like we're the only species that gets consent the deer wants to fuck right. the deer it's over like there's no yeah, rape culture which it's- isn't to say that like some of the issues that people talk about in papers like that aren't real like but there's, there's, def- there's, park, there's something dude, behind like- it but like the <laughs> fact that you can the fact that you can take it to this extreme and people will still go along with it if it has the right trappings and the right jargon. Like, I think that's yeah. what they were trying to satirize. Yeah. You know? And, like, that, I think, they kind of successfully proved that you can kind of, you can take it past the point where it's a good idea. But if it sounds right and you use the right words. Well, I, th- I think that it effectively get a, showed Get away how, with it, which is kind of a problem, you know? I think that it effectively showed that basically, like, college campus culture is nothing like it was even well the weird thing is those papers aren't even being read by college kids they're like, being taught like the concepts are being taught by college professors to those kids though right they're being published by college professors yeah but i think so in my experience as someone who's recently in college i think you're more influenced by your peers than you are by your professors yeah, like there's still that authority count, though, dude like if you start your class with a prayer and a scripture for the book of mormon it's a little bit <laughs> well i was remember i was in the spanish department so you're still talking <laughs> No, here's the thing. So the prayers in Spanish is that what it is? Like well, El Libro no, de no, Mormon, no. de la Mormon. Here's, here's the thing: people don't realize about BYU. Like I went there. There, there are way. parts of BYU that aren't conservative at all. Like you go to the Fine Arts Building; it's still a college Fine Arts Building. So if I was like I was studying Spanish, so that's like humanities and literature and stuff like that. So it still feels like a humanities or literature department. Like I still. You still, you know that college professor thing where they do like, I know this is what they taught you about Columbus in school, but did you know? And then they go on like all this, like, yeah, all of my other professors told me that. Like, I've actually never learned the like correct version of Columbus that you think I learned in elementary school. I've only ever heard the like Columbus was actually a bad guy version. But like. Interesting. Yeah. Like in anytime you're like an English department or a language department. Even at a place like BYU, like I'd, I'd, it's I'd still to much it's, further to the left than the rest of campus. Oh, sure, but but and it's I hung not out mostly with comedians than, and like, singers, Berkeley or Stanford or, or any of those, though. Well, I think at BYU, like there is sort of this feeling that I got that some people are trying to compensate for how conservative the rest of the university is. I've seen that just in Mormonism in general. There's like little pockets yeah, of that. That's that's a very Utah thing. That's a very cognitively dissonant group. <laughs> Those are conflicting ideas. It's it's interesting how it's like, because I I hang out with people. I don't really know what my politics are. I'm probably more liberal than most people of my faith, I would think. But I, I don't know that I would necessarily consider myself super liberal. But like, I'm definitely influenced by a lot of that. Sure. I'm, I, I'm well, dude, in that's, my that's historically speaking, yeah. that's what you happens know. in your twenties. Like, yeah. And so it's like these weird things where like, it's almost like dual sources of shame. Where it's like the only people that want you to feel more ashamed about who you are than religious people are liberals, right? Yeah. Because it's like, hey, by the way, you exhale global warming gas. <laughs> no matter how good you are, you're still causing climate change by existing. Like that's Did that's what it feels like all about the time. Killing yourself with, from liberals, and then, great. Like yeah, and so like you mix that shame with like yeah, you're enabling racism, which means you're also making Jesus feel racism. <laughs> like it's, it's this weird cross pollination of like the LDS guilt and the liberal guilt. That's like always which both of those they, they have mastered the guilt thing. But yeah, my dad always said uh, conservatives want to make you afraid and that liberals want to make you ashamed, and I think that that's an astute observation. I've always enjoyed the observation that says if you're not a liberal when you're 25, you have no heart. But if you're not a conservative when you're 45, you have no brain. Yeah, I mean, I haven't been 45 yet, so I don't know how true it is. But there's a shift that happened. And again, I find myself, I I would say that I am classically liberal, which makes me basically a (laughs) to the right moderate in our (laughs) in our current um, political climate. Like I'm fiscally conservative. You're liberal for Utah, but conservative for Utah comedians. Oh yeah, yeah. I'm not that's, like that's probably how I would peg you. Oh, for sure. Well, it's because I'm I'm older, like, and I've 
Yeah. I've had to take some lumps from life and I recognize that as much as my I want my feelings to matter at a certain point that it's actually results that I have to produce if things are going to change and that that just it gets come to me over time. Like when I was in my 20s, I was very uh I was I was way more liberal than I am now. Like I said, like I'm socially liberal. You want to go get gay married and do that? Like, have at it. I don't care. Just stay out of my wallet. Like like there's sure. ways to handle that other than just taxing the gills out of the peop- out of the mechanisms that create opportunity. And <clears throat> having said that though, like I it's been this weird shift that we're seeing in politics. Like they call it the regressive left. They're way more like controlling and freakish about weird stuff than the right is, and it used to be opposite. It used to be like the right was the control, the religion, the thing. And it's like now, like you say the wrong pronoun, they want to put you in jail. Like that's literally like a movement to like have there be criminalization for well, the, the ones wrong... that get on TV, right? Usually the more extreme people get more attention. Well, true. But like, you know, you talk about BYU not being, being lib- like BYU doesn't have an Antifa chapter. Like it's, yeah, there's a, you know, there, there's, to me, it's a mechanism of, and I've, I've been very open about this for, to me, the difference between right and left is who's your God. And the right, it's in the sky. On the left, it's the government. And the mechanism... Or history, right? Their or, version of heaven is being on the right side of history. right? That's their, ver- well, their that's, version that's of like their, heaven is well, history books will say nice things about you. Well, that, yeah. but, but that ultimately comes back to like a, a, a control thing. Like in, on the right, like they're like, well, God will sort it out. On the left, they're like, the government's going to have to. Because people are... Bro- like on both sides, okay, people yeah, are yeah, broken. From and, a logistics perspective. Yeah. yeah. So then, I don't know where I'm going with that, but anyway, I'm gonna pull this back to the thing I was talking about. Like, so the whole the whole channeling thing, the channeling thing. So like, sure. so I found the politics weirdo, with the weirdo pre- guy. We're back. The weirdo guy, the Bashar guy. Yeah. And then I found this book that was written by this couple called Esther and Jerry Hicks, and this is actually pretty close to mainstream. They've been on Oprah. Like they they they're pretty well famous. And um, their their names in that world. Yeah, Jerry Jerry Hicks has passed away since then, but they have they their books are written in the channeled voice of somebody named Abraham. So when you like buy an Esther and Jerry Hicks book, Abraham's the one talking and it's this channeled person that they talk through. And from a self-development standpoint, their books are a little froofy on some of the shit, but a lot of the stuff is really good. Interesting. It is interesting. It's like one of those things where like I grew up as a, you know, as a grow up as an LDS to talk about like, you know, the, um, you know, where the source of the thing matters too. Like you don't want to get, you know, how do I say this? You know, the demons or the fucking, the, the, I'm, I'm losing my You don't want to get taken in by good ideas from the wrong, from, from the wrong person because yeah, yeah. they'll mix bad ideas. So when I first, when I first the heard the stuff, like, so I was, I so first we shouldn't listen to any ideas. Well, yeah. I mean, well, that's one of the things that's right that's for being problems. made fun of. Right. Is that well, and it's people, one of the things that's a problem any, too. Anytime like, you let people decide who they decide are the good people and the bad people, you run into those problems. But I think the, I think the principle is sound that like there can be people who will have good ideas that you don't need to listen to all of their ideas because they'll also have bad ones. So I think that that's a sound principle, and that you should be aware that sometimes people will say all the right things and have another agenda. Okay, so but, yeah. So let me let me let me add to this then because this is something that I think is is. It's important for the pious and non-pious alike to at least sure. respect. If if right now it was 1821 and we heard about this fucking crazy 14-year-old that was saying that he got to see God and Jesus and that none of the churches were true and everything, uh-huh. would we have the same discontent and contempt for that as we do for the idea of this channeling guy and him talking about being an interdimensional alien. So sure. the answer or to that take qu- it one step further, even things that we all accept now, like imagine you lived in like 200 BC and someone's like, by the way, the earth's the one that revolves around the sun. Yeah, exactly. It's like, well, the exactly. science doesn't exist to prove it yet, but that doesn't make it not true. So for so me, like, I approach it with the same sort of think about the same sort of willingness to be open as I did back when I was more pious and that was uh-huh. like, okay, well, what can I take from this that works? Like, that's why as a, I haven't been to church in forever. Like, that's why as a guy that's like not 
in that world, I don't have guile against it either. I don't care. Sure. There's a lot of great things that come out of a religious life, discipline and community and faith and things that like when you when you remove all that and you're completely in a um, a, a secular mindset doesn't come. And it has collateral damage and there's addiction. There's way like we get to these crazy things that fuck up society. Disease happens because people are doing things that are undisciplined and like it's just a whole different thing. So I I look at like that's why when I hear a story about like, yeah, in 79, yeah, the prophet was praying and he was like, yeah, it's cool. Let the blacks in now. We're good. Where I'm like, okay, well, what what can I take from that that could actually be something that I could learn from and make my life better? Instead right. of turning it into this swift, horrible fucking judgment of a racist move that was that was opportunistic based off the time, mm-hmm. or you know, so it's it's like which is one of the things we overheard that I don't know if you overheard the guy on Saturday was actually saying that that like everything yeah anyway that's not I get see that's that's that's, that's the funny thing about like so so that conference is an exact is a, is a good example of this like I feel like they're they're there to support each other but when you get lost in the weeds and arguing doctrine it seems silly. It's like, yeah. you can't win, dude. It's like, a, who's, is it Chris James that has the joke about... The cage you wouldn't... Yeah. Yeah, where it's like, why would you leave this only to start studying it more yeah. type of thing? You're a tiger but, that just got the cage. Like, yeah. But, I, I mean, if that's what people, what makes people feel better, like, I'm... I'm that's not gonna, my I'm not point, gonna, dude. I'm not going to sit it up doesn't. here and, 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 like, judge them for that. But. Well, that's the thing. I will. That's not what makes them feel better. <laughs> They're bored. Like, that's the funny thing. If you get so wound up, like when this whole thing, when the church changed their policy about the kids for, you know, if you have gay parents, kids can now get baptized again. The, yeah, yeah. the change that happened a couple you know months ago or whatever. People were all up in arms about it. I'm like, you don't have to be a part of the church. And if, if that's important to you, okay. But like, you're just bored. Like, people have too much time on their hands. Can they not seek to affect change, though? But if you're... <sighs> How does getting mad about it change anything? It's not just being mad. That's a step in a process to like affecting something, right? Like saying, I don't agree with this. Like, I don't know. I, I, I get what you're saying. I'm but glad this- you're talking now. This is great. This is Mike <laughs> Thibodeau, by the way, ladies and gentlemen, he's, uh, he's been here want, the whole time. You don't want to get me on the gospel coordinate mic. Let's do it. Make John cry a little bit. But no, I mean, yeah, I, 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 I think- can handle myself. <laughs> Yeah. Did you hear me? Talk? I feel he like said he could. I feel like most of my life as a comedian is proving I can hang. <laughs> yeah. Well, welcome to the Terror Dome here soon, buddy. <laughs> yeah, buddy. But yeah, wait, I, yeah, I, I, I get that. I think a lot of people have had negative experiences, and you can have negative experiences. Anything. I've had negative experiences in a public bathroom. Um, if I want to rail against public bathrooms, I think that's no. Everybody has a right. right to. Like, you can do whatever you want. I'm saying that, like. I think that there comes a certain point where like people aren't thinking it down the line. Yeah. Did are you guys fran- are do you watch the show Billions? No. Okay. So I'm going to do a little spoiler alert cuz the season finale was last night and everybody knows my take on TV spoiler words. I'm just going to say it right now. I'm going to talk about the season finale of Billions. You got a problem with it? Turn this off. And if you don't, I don't care because here's the thing. It's TV. Go watch it right now. This isn't a movie you got to go see. You can watch it while you're shitting on your phone, okay? Like this is not a thing. TV spoilers, get out. Anyway, so there's Axe is the main character. He's a, or a main character. He's a hedge fund guy. He's dating this woman who's also a billionaire who's a hedge fund person. And this opportunity comes for him to make a grip load of money, but he has to basically sabotage her company. She has this childhood dream of taking this store that she used to go to as a kid and bringing it back to glory. So he decides to take this move. And there's this scene where he's like saying, she's like, what? made your sick, twisted mind do this. And he maps out everything. He's like, well, here's where we're at. This was going to go here. This was going to make this. You were going to then do this based off of the evidence here. This was going to happen. And instead of me faking like I know it was going to work out, I'm putting a billion dollars in your pocket, and now we can see where things really are between us. And it's like, and this guy's worth billions in the show. And like, that's kind of his thing is he can basically see the future because he can connect all the dots. And it's like, so back to your thing, it's like, you want to get mad about the public bathroom as a joke, like connect the dots where it ends. And it never ends in a place where you have any control. There's different ways to enact change the way like, and I've, this is my opinion, be the change you want to have. So meta, right? 
<laughs> no, if you have a problem with how people treat you, treat people differently and be an example of what that is and then and, buy, and then attract more people around you that do that and that's how you make change. Yeah. It's not about like yelling louder or getting well, I, mad. I think to your point, Mike, like a lot of the times having that emotional response is the first step, but it needs to be just the first step, right? It can't just right. end there. Like it needs to be followed up with something. Yeah. I know my, so my older brother, Garrett, he's been involved in like some activist causes and stuff and he's like often talked to me about like how he's frustrated that there is like people don't want to like follow leaders in a movement like they don't they don't want to have strong leadership and like defer to people who have experience in like making the practical side of things work they're just you know what i mean there's like this sense of like i want to express my my discontent but it winds up dying there because the the organization never forms to make it successful, you know? And I think that's very much like a feature of my generation that we have this, I don't know. I feel like it's weird. We have this like very accepted ageism against older people. It's like baby boomers screwed everything up and <laughs> there's a reason for all the problems. It's like, yeah, but like a lot it's of, it's really alarming to me how like the white straight man is blamed for everything too. Like that's really alarming to me. Yeah, it's almost well. One of the things that that bothers me about that is that like when you make this sort of monolith of like straight white guy, you make it seem so powerful that like I lose hope that we can even change. You know what I mean? It's like society. It's it's almost like society did not exist, and then racism declared that society would be born. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like. They make like racism into a devil, but like with the power of God, that it's like omn, it's omnipresent, yeah. it's omnipotent, and it's, and it's only like if it's one, if it's that big and it's that, that powerful, like where's the, where's even the hope that we can change it? Like I, that's the thing. That's why I wrote that joke. Like the you mentioned the joke that I had about like going to people when you're when you're depressed and their politics getting in the way. It's yeah. that like. A lot of the times I, I talk to people who are like very activist and like very that way. And it makes me feel so hopeless because they're like racism has infiltrated every single facet of society. And then it's like, then I think we lost. Like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't feel like we well, can change. Like, like they yeah. don't. I, I feel like people don't supply enough hope that it can change. What they just say is it needs to. But they don't like. I feel like a lot of times people talk to me and they don't make me feel like it's possible to change, but they make me feel like I have a responsibility. So it's like almost yeah, setting like me weird. up for failure. Yeah. You know? Well, and, and, and to me, one of the things that's most peculiar too, is it like, is a, is a straight white male. There's certain things where you don't have societal permission to share your opinion about it because you're either a part of the patriarchy, you're a part of the problem, you're inherent. Uh, this, this idea of innate guilt that just by being a white man, sure. you're innately racist, which is the new original sin in my book. But, but yeah, but the irony of that is that when you look specifically at the definition of marginalization, that's exactly what it is. You don't yeah. count and your opinion doesn't matter because you're a part of this group. Yeah, like I that does bother me, but I also do have like a sense of scale, right? That like I think sometimes especially comedians we talk about like the political correctness thing. It's like killing comedy. It's like like let's not forget that like Lenny Bruce like got arrested for his act. Like George yeah, Carlin, like it went to like the Supreme Court, and nobody so, would like, care. Like, well, I guess that's what I mean is that like now for the most part, like you get crap on Twitter, which is not as severe as like yeah. the pushback that comedians used to get, even if they're getting pushback for different things. Yeah, like it's good to have a sense of scale and a sense of perspective when it comes to that. Yeah, that's fair. Yeah, Mike, I agree. <laughs> I'm gonna I'm gonna edit out every conversation with Mike and it'll be a six minute IGTV clip. <laughs> oh my gosh. Just a bunch of of out of context like yeah. The good part about Mike though yeah, is at okay. least he doesn't sit there and go, Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, because as an edit, like as an audio engineer, like I hate it when people do that because I'm like, just <laughs> shut up while the guy's talking. You don't need to sit there and nod audibly. That's yeah. what a yeah, that's what a uh, that's what it is. It's a nod that's audible. Yeah. I feel like an ugly guy trying to close the deal with two really hot chicks, and I don't know where to interject into the conversation. Well, that's a really weird example. 
I'm I'm flattered, actually. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> John's like, I'm I'm a hot girl. Can I identify that's as that? I girl? feel like that's a good description of the difference between me and Bryce. Bryce is like, that was a weird metaphor, dude. And I'm like, thanks, Mike. <laughs> I wasn't that aggressive about it. I feel it. like I'm the butters of our friend group. I'm, hey, butters. <laughs> I am so the butters of our consummate group. optimist. Dude, yeah. JD's Cartman. <laughs> <laughs> you think so? Oh yeah, dude. True, true. Uh, I joke with him how he's got it pinned all the time. There's no like, there's no five on the scale of one to ten with JD. He's at a nothing or a ten. Just I keep foot wanting. On the gas. Have you ever heard him talking about when he used to work for Larry H. Miller and like the crap that they? Yeah, he like got all. a settlement from. I him keep everything. wanting him to do a set about them. I don't know if he's like allowed to or whatever, but there like, might be like a yeah, like a there might be something in some the NDA where he can't say certain things. Yeah. Hmm. Well, we're at an hour fifty. That seems to be about the time. Anything else you want to talk about, Mike? You chatty Kathy over there. Uh, have your pets spayed or neutered? Thanks, Bob. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's. Uh, I don't know. I. Uh, I'm hoping that I can get back on the podcast one of these days. I know this is the first <laughs> three way. I'm so sorry. I tried. Yeah. I just, yeah. Yeah. I I'll like it. You, I like It's like having a live podcast that I'm listening to. I'm, like, I'm going to oh. give you one more time, Mike. One more time. Knock your socks off. And I don't want to talk to myself that time. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I came into this with the understanding that this is the John Deming show with Mike. Whoa, as, as as oh, fuck, dude. We, I, I was scrapping this whole thing then. This I would apologize be if I gave you that indication. I'll I certainly save this did not for my to. Patreon subscribers. <laughs> yeah. Well, there was part of me that was wonder that w- that almost didn't come because because Blaze wanted to do it. I was like, oh, well, I don't know if Blaze. Well, is dude, bad Blaze and JD are going to come on. The, like, I want that so oh, bad. nice. It's going to be fun. So bad, dude. He's yeah. he's another one that's one of those guys. It's so funny. He just has to like figure out his stuff on stage. Like it's, it's, he, the mm. shit he writes in the chat, dude, killer. He's a fucking killer. Love that guy. Well, that, like the dynamic with JD. Like JD just JD <laughs> rides him hard. Like I, I feel yeah. like they could take the gloves off, have a good dialogue. Oh, yeah. that yeah, yeah, that yeah. would be exciting. Me and Blaze, yeah. will, I mean, we'll, we'll uh, I'll, I'll be there to protect Blaze if JD gets a little too rowdy. I think I, was, Blaze, I think he's got it, man. One time I was <laughs> talking to to Dennis, and he was talking about how he wanted to do because he, he has a few ideas for podcasts that he's had, and one of them he wanted to get like people together who like should not be on a podcast together, and just, <laughs> and just watch the fireworks like almost like a, a Jerry good, Springer-ish good radio, dude. Thing. Yeah. And just get people who are like either completely disagree with each other or just like irreconcilably different, and just have them It'd be like getting my ex-wife on here. <laughs> Would that ever be a possibility? Fuck no, dude. She doesn't even talk to me. I haven't talked to her in probably eight years. Really? Yeah, she won't Yikes. talk to me. All correspondence through a legal she, channel. She wants. Well, yeah, she said at one point in the past that she wants a written record of all communication between me. Dude, she thinks I'm the most horrible person in the world. It's really pathetic. It, I'm really sorry it, to hear that, man. It's not a bad idea because it works both ways. It works in your benefit to protect you. So, I mean, I, it sucks. I think you should have a dialogue with the... Well, dude, the reason, why, the reason why it's so hurtful to me is because of a simple principle. It's easy to hate from a distance. And we have daughters together. And my daughters, they're 16 and 14. I love them to death, but they have some challenges that they would not have in their young lives if their mother and, fa- and father could figure out how to fucking co-parent. But there's none of that right now. There's like a superimposing of the dad figure there. And I'm just this guy that has no say in anything. And when I try to take a say or make a say, it becomes a thing that's it's just ugly. Well, I mean, the whole mechanism behind civil divorce in the United States, and especially in Utah, is not set up to foster any type of co-parenting. Oh, no, dude. And like that, that is one of the that is one of the, the areas you talk about a hierarchy or a, a, a system. There is a no equality in the divorce system when it well, comes to children. I, I talked to John about this on the way home or on the way up. Mm-hmm. In the system, literally your rights, especially as a as a father, are taken away without any due process. Right? Yeah. You've no, you've had no infractions of the law. You have no violations arbitrarily. The court system, and a lot of times it's not even a full-on judge, it's a, it's a commissioner, yep. says, I'm making a ruling without 
sorry, I've got 50 of these I got to go through today. Yep. I'm making a ruling on yours, which means they give you no mind, and they always side, not always, it's a blanket statement, but most always with the mom. And and that's that's an inherent problem. Uh, that's a gender inequality. Granted, I know some people won't like that, but that's exactly what it is. We don't live in an equal world. Like, I'm tired of trying to perpetuate that idea. Nothing, nothing is the same. We could do better about making things more fair. But equal, like we're not equal. We're not the same. We're equal. We're not the same. That's that's the difference. It's not equality. It's the sameness. Yeah, I've I've I a lot of the challenges that I deal with on a personal level with resentment, with anger, and everything are are from that. I made one bad move when I got divorced. Out of charity, I let her leave the state to go heal, quote unquote at her folks' place in Oregon with the promise she would come back and everything, and then never did. And I, Was the promise in writing? Nope. <laughs> Sounds Because like I was an idiot. Like, that's, that one decision has painted a picture and caused it where I've had to chase her around the country as she's without consequence been able to move and everything, and 100% of the expense of, of, the, of everything is on me to see my daughters. And it's extremely challenging when I don't have any money. Mm-hmm. And then I'm trying to like leverage things or borrow or whatever to have that. And then, I mean, there's a, I don't, we could go into a, this. I don't want to record that if we're going to talk about it. Anyway, <laughs> so let's just wrap this up. <laughs> On that happy note. Yeah. Well, uh, what should we call this episode? I got to figure it out. Uh, three, degree, three degrees of glory. Okay, there it is. Done. Okay. <laughs> Please say something, Mike. Thanks, uh, <laughs> thanks for coming up, guys. We'll do this again. Like I, I, I told you guys, I've got some cool stuff coming where I'll be able to have more interactive, funny type stuff with uh, the yeah. podcast here. No, I love doing this. Anytime you want to have me on, I'm, I'm happy to be on. Okay. How can we reach you on your social media channels, John? I am at John Deming three J O H N D E M I N G three on Twitter and Instagram. <laughs> what about you, Mike? Uh, I have a token Twitter account. Uh, I'm here uh, so I don't get fined. It's at Big Mike Tibbs, T H I B S. Uh, evidently, people don't know how to pronounce my last name. Uh, yeah, I have zero tweets. I have a couple followers, and that's about it. Yeah, you guys. No tweets fun. and followers. That's an accomplishment. Yeah, they're like token friends. I think Tyson Wood took pity on me. He's like, hey, Mike's on here. Cool. That sounds about right. Anyway, love you guys. Uh, You know the drill. That's my time. Hey, wait, before you go. Look, I wanted to tell you how to engage with me outside of this podcast, Grab the Mic. Naturally, this is a comedy show, so it helps me a ton if you tell your friends about it, if you go to iTunes and leave a five-star rating and review. Puts me higher in the rankings, gets me exposed by more people. (laughs) Exposed by more people. Anyway... Even if you didn't like the show, come back next week because I'm sure it'll be different. I'm always looking to make you laugh, put out great content. Anyway, go to BricePrescott.com. I got a bunch of stuff there that outside of comedy might actually help you to try to have your life be a little bit better. Imagine that. Anyway, like I always say, until next time, take it a day at a time. I'm out. <laughs>